That might be a good thing. I just have to check something out here. It's not making any sense to me, but then technology never does. That's not the fun part. Whoopsie. All right, it's finally looking. All right, how about that? One of these days, I'm going to get it right the first time. All right, it's finally looking. All right. How okay. Hi there, Irene. Um, yeah, so people with BPD relationships, right? People with codependency in these relationships with people with BPD. All of the things that we know are so difficult, right? And it's interesting when I had my start last time because, oh, no, I won't even mention it. It doesn't matter. So, yeah, should should people be, I don't like the word should, but should you really be starting a, a romantic relationship with a person with borderline personality? Well, the answer is kind of clearly no. But it happens because a lot of people don't know that they have BPD. And, and then even more people that start relationships with people with BPD don't know that they have BPD or it may well have or might have been diagnosed and not told you. So let me see here. I had a starting place because I haven't been live on this channel for like almost two months now or more. And so maybe nobody will find me. Well, I mean, Irene too. Well, maybe nobody will find me, so I had to come prepared to talk, 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 talk. That makes a live stream, too. Anyway. So. Everybody sort of knows, or eventually finds out the hard way, that people with BPD are well known to commonly experience relationships that are chaotic, intense, conflict-laden, and basically, I would say, as I often do, impossible just not possible so if people are considering now now a lot of people here or people that might come and listen to this later on the channel you're obviously not just considering starting a relationship with someone with bp at this point but if you're in one now it's important or if you're the ex and you're like in that zone of like are they coming back that what did i call that the revolving door relationship or is it the on-off, break-up, recycle? Or are you still in the relationship? It's important to educate yourself about the disorder and what to expect. But a lot of people already know what to expect. And then the problem is, how do you stop wanting to be with that person when your heart says one thing and maybe your head is saying something else? So I'm not going to go through what is BPD. Uh... Okay, so yeah, we're, I'm just trying to think where I should start here. So, you know, one of the main, actually there was a study, but you know, when I say that, it's like, what do these studies really prove? But there was a study that demonstrated that women with BPD symptoms reported greater chronic relationship stress and more frequent conflicts. Oh, I think I could explain that one really quickly because the men with BPD just not so tuned in. And how, how much do they really study men with BPD compared to women? Hmm, not much, really. And then the more severe that a person's uh, symptoms of BPD or their BPD is, um, the less relationship satisfaction that their partners report. No kidding, eh? Hmm, try no relationship satisfaction there. Characteristic of borderline personality disorder is having trouble maintaining relationships. And of course, the almighty word, quote, research, unquote has also shown that BPD symptoms are, symptoms are associated with a greater number of romantic relationships over the course of someone's life. So people with BPD are often terrified that others will leave them. So abandonment fear, yes. They can also shift suddenly to feeling smothered and, well, they're always fearing intimacy, but it's the approach avoidance conflict struggle, which I have a couple of videos up here about that specifically, but the push-pull that everybody's familiar with so, you know, they come on like gangbusters and they mirror you and they idealize you and all that stuff and it feels so good, but it isn't real. And the idealization isn't really them seeing or hearing you or seeing you, even though they're totally focused on you. No, they're really experiencing you as object other, parent representation of maybe parent never had or really good parent in the beginning, but unbeknownst to them and unbeknownst to people that get in relationships with them. So uh, the constant back and forth between demands for love and attention and sudden withdrawal or isolation common 
when people with BPD untreated or otherwise and not well treated or, you know, there's some people out there with BPD, they've been in therapy for a lot of years. They've been working with clients over time and recently. And, you know, they'll be like, but she told me, like, she's been in therapy for three years, two years, a year and a half, five years. And this is after the breakup, right? But she told me, she told me that she was in remission. Let's not even go there. Because what does that mean? I could do three, four, five hours on that all alone by itself. But I'll give you this in a snippet. So people with BPD can have had or still be having a lot of therapy and never get to that place that I've always been trying to define things by unless and until significant treatment. There's a lot of them will have what seems like significant treatment, only, uh-oh, they're not really changing. And uh, hey there, Matt. You said you're new here. Well, welcome. Um. I'm not really paying attention to that anymore, Irene. I got I got out. Um, I peek once in a while. I don't know what's going on with her at all. I know that she's in Kuwait and chasing that middle. You know, I saw one thing the other day. We don't want to mix and match channels here. But, um, yeah, people are questioning if, if Salah is real because he hasn't been seen on camera. It's a mess. Um, Matt, your videos are helping me my um, with my breakup from an undiagnosed BPD mother of my child. Well, I'm really glad. I, I'm sorry to hear you're going through that, but I'm glad that my videos or podcasts or this audio stuff I do, whatever we call it, I'm just glad the content's helpful. Um, and you said, which has a side of covert narcissism. Could well be. Could well be. And Deborah, hey there, people with BPD may not be capable of relationships, but sure can start a new relationship before they walk away from the one they're in. Well, yes, the monkey branching. And what people with BPD are doing and what they think they're doing and what they're intending to do versus what ends up happening, two very vastly different things. But yeah, if we just use the word relationship loosely, yeah, they, they're really good at moving on to the next one or, or doing that before they leave the one they're in. But remember, that that's not them headed for any healthy or stable relationship. And that also, your comment speaks to the fact of what I just said, that research has shown, not that I'm so into research because half of it's not backed up and not really known factually, but that people with BPD will tend to have many more relationships or partners, significant other relationships in their lives. So, gee, I wonder why, right? So, and I realize I'm going to take a lot of heat for this, but I really believe that the most accurate thing I could state now, and, and I've tried not to, about relationships and people with BPD is, like I said earlier, like I, I was saying, until unless they've had significant treatment, right? But that's not always the case. And so I would have to say now, and this gets more contentious, that People with BPD, or once you figure this out, or they have the patterns of whether they're diagnosed or not diagnosed, it's really like I have to put it this way now that these relationships are not going to work out unless the person with BPD no longer has BPD. That's controversial. So, what am I saying? That the relationships will not work out like high, high, almost all, right? And then there are people that are getting and have been, not just in a, in a new relationship, but for a long time, they've really been in therapy for a long time. It's a good modality. It's a good fit. They're really growing. Because here's the thing. People with BPD can heal and recover. Oh, yes, they can. But, but, unless and until they do that, no, they're not relationship capable. They're not, I have to, I have to borrow a quote from a cluster B ex of mine from many years ago. They're not relationship material. And what that ex-partner a long time ago, the BPD, NPD alcoholic I was with, oh, what she said to me one day was, because, you know, in, in, in the incredible um, self-aggrandizing arrogance of the over grandiose narcissist, she said one day there was some, you know, I don't know, there was an issue she was having or something. And she sat me down to talk about it. And she said, you know, 
something, something, something about me. I don't remember what it was a long time ago. I couldn't care less. And she goes, unlike, and it was all, oh, oh, arrogant. I can't. She goes, unlike you, I, meaning that BPD, NPD alcoholic partner I had for like, you know, a little while way back. I, she says of herself, I am sophisticated relationship material <laughs> to which I honestly got it. Like I fell down laughing. I did. Thought I was going to, you know, uh, not have dry pants anymore. It was hilarious. But the bottom line is this is how out of touch they are. <laughs> you know, whether it's it's BPD patterns of they haven't been diagnosed or they are going to have some of those narcissistic traits, et cetera. And, you know, a lot of people with BPD, I, I don't want to like add the stigma, but I have to be real here. So, yes, the contentious part of this is going to be that I said. So what am I saying, really? What I'm saying is that it's not really in anybody's best interest to be in a relationship with anybody with borderline personality. That's what I'm saying. So unless until they recover and then people are going to go, oh, well, that's not possible and you can't do that. And But unless they do, they're not relationship material. They're just not, not for healthy, consistent, congruent, mutual, reciprocal, adult relating, right? So it's going to be that on and off, that back and forth, that push pull. If, if they don't know who they are, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, intellectually, they know what they're doing, but emotionally, that's a whole other freaking story. So that's how serious I'm about this now. And then people are going to go, oh, but you know, they can, I see it everywhere. And everywhere my name shows up or somebody's mentioned me, I see it. Not not because they're necessarily talking about me personally. But, yeah, they don't believe I recovered either. I don't personally give a crap. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just trying to look here. Uh, okay. So this is, um, don't mind me, but when I use StreamYard, it, it like, drives me up one side of the room and down the other because I'm trying to monitor something on a phone and also follow comments in teeny teeny little print here they don't think about us old parts um soul burning 2000 hey there uh rick well welcome and nice to meet you too and you said five years off and on hope i can stay away this time the anxiety gets to you though well definitely it's it's like quite the dilemma like for real right and what was real what wasn't real can ruminate forever if you let it Yes, and that's why these relationships are uniquely the narcissist ones too, but in their own way. But the borderline relationship breakup is uniquely torturous and very painful and very difficult not to re-engage once the relationship has, well, one thinks ended, but maybe not really ended. And RMJ, hey there. Um, I had one who used me after the death of my mother. Very sorry to hear that and knew this, and played me anyway, even though she knew my mom died. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that, because you know what? They don't deal with things like that. They don't deal with, A, they don't even, like, they're not there for you, right? They're just never there for you when you need them. But um, they also don't kind of tend to take in, they're, they're not all the same, right? But a lot of people with BPD are so afraid of abandonment and so afraid of loss they can't handle someone else or maybe someone in their own life dying. But I'm sorry to hear you went through that because there will be no empathy. There will be no sweet, like, support for you, et cetera. Um, and you said, I still struggle with humiliation and pain as I really cared for her. No, well, it's interesting because, you know, the understandable, and I'm sorry you're still in pain, but I guess the humiliation part, you know, that's something to, you know, maybe you're working with someone and, Something to look at in a process, though, because that likely comes from childhood. You're probably carrying that humiliation from somewhere else because I'm not saying you shouldn't feel that way. It's how you feel. But the question would be, why do you feel humiliated for trying to love someone? I mean, a lot of people will feel shame after because, you know, it's it's awful the way these relationships end. And Yvonne, hey there, um, can a person with BPD be a professional ex-doctor or nurse? Um, people with BPD are therapists, lawyers, doctors, nurses, you name it. They have jobs in all walks of life. So, um, and when they're untreated and they're in mental health, yikes. And when they're untreated and they're in a profession in general, like a doctor or a nurse or a former 
doctor, nurse. Yikes again. And there are narcissists, you know, that are therapists, and there are probably are psychopaths too. So I don't know about psychopaths because how would they how would they deal with people at all without you know losing their mind because they they really they're different. But the point is, yeah, unfortunately, in all the professions and kind of careers and also jobs, there are cluster bees everywhere. Unfortunately, now. And um, you said, yeah, you said to soul burning, the gaslighting and stories was enough to make me think I was with the one with BPD. Sorry. Oh, you were the one with BPD. Yeah. To make you think that as a female dating a male with BPD, it can be scary. Yes. With the anger issues. Definitely. And, you know, on average, like in the studies that have been done and uh, males with BPD are, have a much higher percentage of actual violence than females, but that's not to say females have a level with BPD of zero, but yeah, males, I, I got to do more on male BPDs because, you know, I'm always talking about women, uh, because a lot of men watch the channel and I have a lot of men that are clients and, um, and soul burning is saying that that happened to her also. Oh, sorry. Him also, pardon me. Um, and you said, as uh, I was calling family members about my mom passing, I missed my BPD calling me and was accused of cheating as I'm making funeral arrangements. Oh, wow. I'm so sorry to hear that. There's no sense. No, there absolutely isn't. And that, and that's really, and people go by this, you know, the red flags the, until they learn more right at the other side of the relationship. It's like when somebody is that insensitive to what you're going through and then they have like an accusation to boot, that's, that's a huge red flag, but, um, oh yes, yes. Well, RMJ, there's living proof there that person you were with, with BPD was a nurse. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they can't be good nurses, but you know, it's different than an interpersonal relationship. Matt said, I wish I could totally cut off my ex, but we have a five-year-old daughter to share custody and raise. My ex is using my daughter as a pawn. I know I'm so sorry to hear that because that pretty much almost always is the case to manipulate me into doing what she wants and needs. Well, and you know, it depends what kind of um, situation you were in. Was was that a marriage? Did, was it divorce? How was the custody arrangement agreed on? And what were the parameters if, if there were, you know, some parameters? Because this is where people in co-parenting with a BPDX need to really go extremely low contact. And yeah, that can be rough for a while. That's not easy to do. But what that means is that, you know, you're only, you know, you could try your best or maybe see if you can try a little harder, but it's, it's not like it's that easy. You only really want to communicate about your, your five-year-old daughter when you have to. And then you don't, yeah, she's using your daughter as a pawn to manipulate you. Well, that's that's what you have to try to start to set some boundaries around gently at first and and you know kind of ease her into that but but that's really difficult stuff and she told me i'm a narcissist oh you know what that's a dime a dozen thing right now and, and, and i'm not trying to minimize that for you but here's the thing well clients i don't know how long this has been going on maybe a year or more maybe longer but i've had so many clients say to me and new clients coming all the time. And as they're starting to describe the situation where they want to start, they'll often say, and I'm worried I'm a narcissist because she called me a narcissist, or maybe he called, you know, I don't know if male borderlines are into calling women narcissists as much, but the women sure are. And the bottom line is, you know, I just think they picked us up online. I just think like in their little spaces, uh, you know, deepening their sort of, way off, whacked out, for lack of a better way to put it, narratives that they share with each other. This is something going around because almost everybody's reporting that now that's been with somebody with BPD. So, you know, it, it definitely doesn't mean that you're a narcissist, that's for sure. And and by the way, who would take the word of somebody with BPD with all the projection and stuff that they're doing? So, um, yeah, the approach avoidance conflict is why the relationships are going to be impossible, which is the person with BPD's issue. And, and you know, they're not always consciously aware of what drives what they do. Um, and, of course, they don't feel like they're responsible for anything that they do or difficulties that they cause or raging or withdrawing or what have you. 
So, you know, a lot of people have been with somebody with BPD, you know, their emotions could lead, even result to, um, <laughs> I got a message on my, I'm just looking at something on my phone, some notes and a message came by and it's like the Toronto Maple Leafs goalie just got hurt. So like, never mind that team anyway, because we don't have another one that can play hockey. Sorry, off topic. So a lot of times people with BPD, not all, but many, will have like temper tantrums, be frantically trying to avoid abandonment or whatever the case is, their emotions, maybe pleading, making public scenes or being very angry, screaming at you or and or making false accusations right there in public so that they're in many ways physically, even publicly, but especially often at home trying to prevent the other person from leaving. And I think this happens with some women with BPD, you know, when they're in a relationship with a man, but many males with BPD will totally entrap women in rooms. It's called, they're not going to let you out until they're done. And then, you know, the risk of something physical happen goes up exponentially. So what's another reason that borderlines are not capable of relationships? Lying. Yes, pathological lying and um, lying and deception are not behaviors included in the formal diagnostic criteria. Does anybody care? Because I don't. I don't think people care. Um, but that's something that, you know, I, I, I just took note of it there. But, um, yeah, for a lot of people who are with somebody with BPD, not that it would be the biggest or only concern, but lying becomes a huge concern. And um, and sometimes they say out there, it's because people with BPD just tend to see things very differently than others, as if that's really what, well, they do, but that's not any excuse for the lies. And often, you know, when they lie, it could be really important stuff for sure, and it could be false accusations, but it can be often such childlike lies that you're like, you see right through it, you, you know, like, it could be something as simple as, you know, like there's a cake on the table there and uh, I don't know, suddenly half of it's gone. And they said, well, I didn't eat it. Bad example. Cause you know, not everybody with BP is going to like want to eat half a cake. Just saying. And they'll say like, you'll say, well, what happened to that cake? Like, you know, you were in here and nobody else is around and you might not care. You're just inquiring. And they'll be like, what cake? I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't eat any cake. You ate the cake. You know what I mean? It's just senseless nonsense. It's so childish. And also, people with BPD, as many people know, have they're very impulsive in many different ways. But impulsive sexuality is another classic symptom of BPD that not everybody with BPD has, but many do. And many people with BPD struggle with issues around, I mean, well, you know, with sexuality. Also, a large percentage of people with BPD experienced Yes, unfortunate, you know, really tremendous adverse experience in that area. And that can make the whole situation complicated, or it often makes, I'm not sure about borderline males, because they may, but it makes women, you know, just uh, borderline women, just like, let's do everything all the time, let's do anything, and it's great, and yet, in physical intimacy, and yet, I've had so many clients describe to me that was the case. And they're very much missing that, but they weren't really connected to the person. We're really connected to the partner or to the wife or to the ex-wife now. Um, even in those moments of what was ecstatically fantastic otherwise. And of course, there are people at BP that go the other way and they really don't want to be involved with physical relations and they're kind of, you know, uh, experience the same adverse experience, but deal with it very differently. Um the other thing, too, which should be pretty obvious, right, but in, in the context of relationships and, and, you know, especially younger women with BPD, but it could happen, you know, throughout their childbearing um, age, you know, time in life, that um, research has also shown that there's a higher correlation of people with BPD, are, it's associated with higher incidence of unplanned pregnancies in women. Um, so other symptoms that really interfere with dating relationships, uh, BPD impulsivity can be self-harm, dissociative symptoms, 
can have an indirect or direct impact on relationships. And if a loved one um, with BPD is engaging in impulsive behaviors, uh, like going on spending sprees, it can cause major stress, obviously financially. Uh, maybe they don't want to be here anymore and they're making those gestures, which, you know, some people really feel with BPD and other people know they don't, but they will manipulate and exploit with that as well. Uh, and they don't think about how other people feel. They just really don't even consider it because they're just trying to get their own needs met, right? That's what they would say. And um, in starting a romantic relationship, which most people here know already, that doesn't work. Um, so people with BPD can have positive qualities, right? Yeah, they certainly can. But in romantic relationships, even if you're the favorite person in friendships, even in uh, if it's a family member or a parent, a lot of people with BPD, you know, can be really fun and exciting for a while. And then what happens, right? Then what happens? And people wonder, will the relationship last? Well, the answer is pretty much no. Although there are people with BPD that are more clingy, more needy, different, just different manifestation of BPD in some individuals. And what does that look like? And what will that mean? Well, sometimes, and I don't mean to say this in a rude way, but people can't get rid of them. And I actually went through that first relationship I had in my life when I was really quite young for like 10 years and or 13 years, whatever it was. And yes, I was going through therapy and I did heal and I did recover. And, and let me just add in here for all the skeptics, which doesn't bother me in the least, but people say things out there that aren't true. I never claimed that I cured myself. It, BPD doesn't need to be cured. It needs to be healed and recovered from. And I was told that by the therapist I was working with toward the end of my therapy. And they had all these measurement scales and charts and whatever that weren't, you know, because I was never properly diagnosed, just labeled. But so there was all that. And they told me that I had recovered and they showed me the measurements of how and what, you know, within reason and, uh, you know, different scales of assessment. And then I was reassessed and in a study five years later. So just saying, you know, just saying for the rumors out there that are never correct about moi, not that I really care, but um, yeah, there was something else I was going to say there, and I guess I lost my train of thought. It went chugging down another course. Okay, so where am I here with comments? You know, I need to find a way to make these bigger. Oh, hang on. Maybe this will work. This could either work or disturb everything. Okay, so let's just keep our fingers crossed. I'm going to try... Hopefully it doesn't affect what you're seeing. No, it doesn't look like it on my phone. Okay, because I can't read these friggin' comments. I'm not 25 or 30 or 40 anymore. They were way too small. Uh, hey there, um, Chu Bang Boon. Um, you said good to hear from me. Well, it thank you for being here. And um, it's just been a long time since I've done a live stream. I hope to do a few more a little more regularly than I have done, but you know, Hey, and Avonja children raised by parents with BPD, um, capable of having quality relationships as adults. Well, it depends to the degree, uh, that they were parented. If they have resiliency and if they were parent parented healthy enough. Um, but you know, like they say that if you have a borderline mother, for example, I mean, a borderline father wouldn't be a picnic either. But if a child has a borderline mother, untreated, let's say, because I'm not going to say every borderline woman is a horrible mother, but most of them struggle a lot. And then a child has a five time more likely likelihood of be, being diagnosed with BPD. And, you know, that's not been proven to be anything to do with genetics so far. So we don't know on that front. Or that's what I would say is they don't know. Like we, I'm not part of their big research, you know, uh, but, but yeah, so the thing is like, if you have a BPD mother and then, um, or, you know, parents <clears throat> or parents, like I had two cluster B parents, I was kind of sunk there, wasn't I? Like so many other people, uh, then we have to do a lot of therapy, but we, we can get through it. But the bottom line is it depends on resiliency of temperament, what exactly happens. And it even depends on what happens in the womb, believe it or not. So neuroscience is teaching us a lot about, you know, why are some 
people born, so babies born with really high sensitive temperaments and others aren't even from the same mother, you know, depending on birth order, of course matters, but whatever mother's going through and if somebody has BPD, right. And if they're untreated, they're going to be like stressed out. They're going to be anxious. They're going to be having roller coaster moods and all of that. If they're carrying a child. So all of those, you know, different, hormones and neurotransmitters and the dopamine and the stress hormone, the cortisol, all this stuff as it's being, you know, released into a woman with BPD who's, who's pregnant into her body, it's going to affect the child. So it's thought that some of this might create that really sensitive temperament. And then, you know, what psychiatry has always said, but I don't know if they like what they used to say, because they're changing everything every other day for their own purposes. That's my contention anyway agenda-sized stuff that isn't really to help people. So the bottom line is that they used to always say that this is really insensitive, not insensitive, sorry, but that too, really sensitive temperament child then meets with an invalidating environment. If it, and if they have a BPD mother, chances are they're not going to have the attunement necessary to create a healthy bond from infancy on. This is going to result in arrested emotional development and the child having the, the growing child having the same problem as the mother or parent. So it just depends on a lot of things, but I don't think they can prove anything genetic right now. So it seems to be more the lack of nurture versus the struggle for us to understand if it comes from nature. And, and let me just say, like I had two cluster B parents, right? My mother was, Maybe like, I think BPD, NPD, but like covert narcissist would be the strongest thing about her. And bottom line was, I don't know why she had kids because she certainly wasn't interested. And that was, I don't remember, but just, you know, stories from the family, piecing things together in different ways. But no, I do not remember infancy. I just remember I had a traumatic birth and then in infancy and whatnot, like, and then the, the rest of my life I can remember like growing up. She couldn't care less if I was there or not. Like, it just is like, you know, why bother? Um, Deborah, when someone with BP is good, they're very good. Well, and that seems like loving, right? And they can be kind. And it could be an expression of some kind of loving, maybe in some way, but it's not really the healthy, consistent love, you know. But you said even sorrowful. Yes, they do have many feelings that will get shut down when they're triggered and they start really defending and all of that stuff. And you said, but when they're bad, they're really, really bad. This is true because they have a whole, they're lacking self. And that's really important. And a lot of people are continually asking me like, what does that really mean? But the thing is, so they're so dichotomous, right? Because splitting is a major defense mechanism in BPD. And by the way, when do you think that starts? It starts in infancy, actually. And so, yeah, what is good is going to be really good because that might be what they experienced right from their young childhood or infancy on. And then what's bad is going to be really, really bad because they just don't know how to regulate anything. You know, they just, yeah, take responsibility, deal with their emotions. And then when they're older, like you get into early adulthood, adulthood, et cetera, through adulthood, it's this unconscious repetition compulsion cycle of things that they keep getting triggered by that go back to the past that they think is happening in the here and now. And, and that's, you know, they, they're not consciously aware of that. And you said the old saying, it takes two to tango. I often blame myself. Well, in a way it does, but you know what I would say? I'm not trying to be really funny here or, or a smart, you know, a-hole or anything. But actually, if you leave a person with BPD alone in a room long enough and say they get a phone call or they're on the Internet or something, uh, they can get all triggered all by themselves. Like, you, you know, and so, yeah, there's there's the uh, dynamics in the relationships with the, the other person and or children or family, but they can really just go off all by themselves. And then the dynamic between where they're at are they withdrawing? Are they yelling? Are they, what are they doing? And then, and then the partner's like, what, like what is happening here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so it does become a two party dynamic or a family dynamic. 
but it really does start with them because they re-experience things all the time unconsciously. And then they blame you for it because they don't know what it is or where it came from. Um, hey there, Alex. And yeah, I'll just call you Alex. <laughs> um, and you said to Deborah, that's because without realizing we split our own personality into all good or bad, it's a defense mechanism developed after, yeah, that we're not aware of. Well, yeah, because it usually happens. It usually really begins in infancy. Not always, maybe, but often. And so with that, um, yeah, you didn't do it to yourself, Alex. You, did, you didn't do it. Nobody does it to themselves, but it happens. Yes, it does. And you said, I found much healing. Um, uh-huh. So, I, well, well, what am I going? Uh-huh. Okay. Through Jesus. So I no longer really subscribe to this belief that it's hopeless unless many years of therapy that only benefits the psychology industry. Well, you know what? I don't know about that. Like, I think you left a comment somewhere that I answered to. And I, and I mean all the respect in the world because, you know, I'm a Christian too. I just think that I can only just tell, say to you, like, in my recovery journey, you know, I believe God was there. I believe that God held me up a lot and uh, I had good, you know, help. But the thing is, you know, it, it says in the Bible for a reason that God even says that we have to do our part too. So I don't know about the idea of like, it'll just, you know, sort of God will take care of it and miraculously go away. I don't know. But the thing is, I don't think like the psychology industry is one thing. It's the psychiatry industry that's even worse. But I think that, um, I don't think it's hopeless unless many years of therapy, but People have to have had some therapy and people have to really be working hard in some process or other, maybe of, of, of your own, maybe maybe it's through your church, maybe it's with a pastor, maybe it's with just people that you know in your church, right? And, and learning and growing from those relationships in that regard. And, and that can happen, but it's just not the more common thing that happens for most people. But the other thing is I, I really am a strong believer that if people stick with therapy, has to be effective treatment, it has to be the right treatment, it has to be with the right therapist for each person. But people can really heal and recover from BPD. So, but you know, I hear you and, and I'm not going to interfere with what you believe. I mean, um, I respect what you believe. And um, Nana, I'm new here. I think I have BPD and trying to educate myself. Well, you're welcome to be here too, because anything and everything I say is not meant to demean anybody. But I kind of am focusing a lot on people that are really hurt by someone with BPD. So that's never, I'm talking about everybody with BPD at any given moment, right? So hope you can understand that. Oh, um, thank you for the super sticker, um, Sir Rance, a lot. Thank you very much. Um, my mother had trauma during her pregnancy, but I believe my BPD is from nurture or perhaps the issues of not getting the nurture that you quite needed. But yeah, I mean, um, I had a traumatic birth too. And um, when your mother experienced while well, she was pregnant with you, these things can have something to do with it. But as far as I know so far from all that they say and all their studies that they can't replicate or prove, at least in the APA and in the US, because there's other things going on in Europe and different places. But yeah, like... It could create that sensitive temperament I was talking about, right? But then it's when that meets with a lack of nurture and an invalidating environment that it really, really gets, well, it's very, very adverse, right? The experience is not going to be healthy for a child. And so rants a lot. If you're, if you're here, please press the like button. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I always forget to say all that YouTube stuff. Hey, subscribe if you haven't, and please like the stream, because I'm usually thinking about what I'm talking about. Um, hey, Derek, is it common for people with BPD to live with their parents well into their adulthood, even if they have the financial capacity to live on their own? Well, you know, I would say, like, all people with BPD aren't the same, but yeah, I mean, and I would think that like, I don't know how common, but it's not uncommon. And I think also that um, nowadays, too, it's probably even more people, depending, you know. And and it depends how enmeshed with 
parents or family that somebody with BPD is because people with BPD also have codependency. So there's that, but I would say it's, it's, I, I don't know how common it is, but it's probably not uncommon. And I know that a lot of clients I've worked with report that, you know, when they break up, whether they're, you know, working through it, you know, or still in that danger zone of going back or Hoover, this, that, um, they say that, you know, they moved in with their parents or their mother. And I've had clients tell me, well, you know, and I think somebody commented on the channel recently, I saw a comment like um, something about that their, the, the borderline that they were with, sorry for using it like that. I don't mean it pejoratively. It's just it, it, less verbiage. Uh, so no disrespect to people with BPD. That the person, I should say, the person with BPD in their life, somebody left a comment recently. Um, yeah, the, a talk to their mother or something with some negative perception, I guess. And then the next thing you know, the mother said leave and they, the, the person with BPD did just leave them. So there's a lot of enmeshment. And that's, so sometimes people with BPD aren't just going to um, see you as object other, but they're literally going to run home to mommy who kind of, except for 13% of the time, has a lot to do with why they're struggling in the first place. But yeah, even if they're financially capable of living on their own, they're not so emotionally capable of doing that, many of them. So yeah, they will definitely often end up back with parents. Uh, Maverick, um, two weeks today of no contact with my ex-girlfriend with BPD. Well, congratulations on those two weeks, and I mean that. You know, just keep taking it a day at a time because that is quite the milestone. And once you get there, you want to make sure you hold on to that because that really helps people progress in whatever ways and you know that they're working on healing and and breaking that unhealthy bond, etc. And you said, yes, I've seen this in my ex. Hmm. Maverick, having a hard time with the discard, not sure who discarded who, as I caught her lying again. Well, yeah, and that is very difficult because it can be very sudden. And it's really disheartening, you know, because people really do want these relationships to work out. But, you know, um, not sure who discarded who that happens or who discarded whom. and sounds like, yeah, it sounds like when you caught her lying again, that maybe that was a bit much. Uh, but moving on, well, good for you, because that's really important. And Vaughn said, I'm a Christian, too. I believe God put health care and mental health care professionals on earth to help us. Well, yes. And I mean, um, it, it's always a touchy subject, that, but I think that you know, it, it says in the Bible, and it's something that I I really pay attention to, that God helps those who help themselves. And so I think it's important to stay in therapy until people are finished with it. Because God will be there with anybody in therapy and helping in that process. And I, I don't know, you know. So everybody's going to have their own feelings on that. But I really agree with what you said there, Yvonne. I wish I would have thought of that, but I didn't. You did. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you. And it's a rant a lot. My mother complained that I disfigured her body due to a C-section years ago. Is this called, um, well, it sounds like it was more traumatic for her, but yeah, it, it would have been difficult for you too. Um, never heard of that until tonight. Please explain. Well, I don't know how her body would have been disfigured. And was she over-exaggerating or, you know, how vain is she? I don't know. <clears throat> but the thing is, um, yeah, that, that would be that type of birth for sure. And because maybe something, maybe, you know, it was time and your mother's there to give birth and then something is going wrong, why they had to do the C-section. And then, um, you know, I don't know, maybe you know more if it disfigured her body actually really or... If she just was like, oh, sorry, bent out of shape. That's really like a kind of funny pun that I didn't intend there. Um, but yeah, often if, it, if it, you know, your mother has BPD or if it's uh, like, you know, my mother, the narcissist, like seriously, they, um, yeah, just giving birth is a whole inconvenience for them and they're not really interested. And then, and then like I had one of those difficult births and, um, I don't know if my mother complained about it or not because 
We would never talk about it ever, ever, ever. And Nana, my father cheated with my mother's sister. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. While my mother was pregnant and my mother left my father. Um, yes. And, and that could affect if, if, um, she did with me. Yeah. So that, if you were the child that she was pregnant with, that could really have an effect on how she would have been relating to you. Another thing that can happen too, you know, if somebody's born with a sensitive temperament, they might not have a cluster B mother all the time. Bottom line is they might have a mother who's just like what you said, something really awful just happened with your mother there. Or they might have like, like one of their parents might pass away or a great loss in life or something else. And, or they have postpartum depression or they can have depression. And then the way that they're going to be able to uh, meet a child or especially an infant's needs is going to be really compromised. And so sometimes those kind of things happen. And it's not always a cluster B mother. And, oh, your father's a narcissist. Yes, well, you said that he was. Yes, wow, yes, yeah, sorry to hear that. And and because cheating with your mother's sister, I mean, not that you have to be a narcissist to do that, but, you know. And um, soul burning. Um, I've been good ignoring 2 a.m. <clears throat> excuse me, 2 a.m. calls and emails. I've been told to ignore her and she'll move to another target, but I worry she might show up somewhere or the ego is too big. They won't do that. Um, well, it depends if you're talking about somebody with, you know, more clearly BPD or patterns thereof versus, you know, mix of narcissistic traits and or being a narcissist. But because people with BPD, it's not really that the ego is too big. It's the false self rising to defend in all these maladaptive defensive defense, like quote coping maladaptive coping mechanisms, basically. So um, ignoring somebody is that's your best thing anyway. But then the thing is, while you're ignoring, it would be more helpful for you probably to go no contact because what do you need to see what is being sent to you for? You know, if there's no other reason. Um, so, yeah, she could show up anywhere. Or um, it, they're all different that way. She could move on to someone else. She could not. She could totally really not be finished. And she could really hoover you and maybe in person, et cetera. So generally in those situations, it's a good idea. I can't remember who said they were had a child involved and who didn't. Sorry. But, it, but if there's no children involved, that it's a good idea to go no contact. And then if they show up at, you know, like to cross your path or whatever, or they show up where you work or where you live, then you have to call the police and, and you have to start setting down that, that it's not, um, can't do this if you share a child, but that it's unnes no, unwanted contact. And then you can start working toward a restraining order simply because, you know, like you're saying you're ignoring, maybe you are the person with the child. I'm sorry. I forget. So if you are, then yes, ignoring would be really helpful. And you said so much comorbid. Um, what's PPD? BPD, NPD. I don't know what PPD is. Um, it's best to walk away. She once explained being upset made her chest feel like exploding and couldn't think how anyone else uh, feels being in so much pain herself. Well, and whether that's a physical manifestation or that was her emotions making her chest feel that way but as she describes it i mean that's one way to put it but it's, it's not only that but it is generally what they are feeling why they don't think of the other person but they don't even know the difference between self and other that they haven't had any treatment and um so the comorbidity of i'm not sure what ppd is like if you could clarify maybe i can get to that but BPD and NPD, I think it's estimated right now 40%, which is getting higher for sure. Because it was, well, a lot lower before. And then I remember when it was around 33%. But the reality of that comorbidity is that they're not going to be diagnosed with both personality disorders. So you see a mixed picture there, a mixed bag then. And then that has many different individual looks to it as well. It can be very, very confusing. Um, and Derek, you mentioned being emotionally capable. 
Um, well, I think, I think what I'm trying to say is that people with BPD are not emotionally capable of, um, you know, relationships. That's the issue. That's the problem. Cause they don't know, like, you know, untreated or even sometimes after some treatment, it depends, but they have to see, I really believe that DBT is not a recovery modality. I'm not saying it doesn't help a lot of people for what I believe it was described and defined as being kind of poor which is to bring people back from the precipice of not wanting to be here anymore, self-harm, et cetera, and bring them through. And the radical acceptance, distress tolerance, among other things, is a way that Linehan devised really brilliantly to help people that were adverse to change to start sort of making some movement toward a more positive direction. And then there's a lot more to say about DBT, but it doesn't, it doesn't address the lost self. It's more like symptom management. And some people do it really well and they really do learn the skills well. And some people kind of don't get it. It doesn't help. And then some people get get it a little bit, but don't really use the skills. And then there's a the reality that people who learn those skills can weaponize them against their partners as well because they're not really using them. So um, anyway, they're not emotionally capable of a healthy relationship. So adult, healthy congruent, consistent, mutual, all the things in an adult relationship that would be healthy would include, right? And they're not independent. And people with codependency got to remember, you need to work through your healing recovery process too. So you can be independent. So you can meet another independent person because the healthiest love, which doesn't make for perfection, but it's interdependent. It's when two people that are independent come together and share interdependence and mutuality and reciprocity. Nobody is emotionally caretaking or being parent for other. So when you said that I said being emotionally capable, um, people with BPD aren't. So I don't know, um, in, you know, that sentence fragment, what specifically you're referring to what I was saying, but hopefully that clears up what I mean. And Deborah said, I ruminate about my ex with BPD doing better with someone else because I was not compassionate enough or strong enough to handle a personality disorder that was not their fault. Is that normal? Well, first of all, I don't know what normal is, but um, in the way that you probably mean the question, like, yes, many people end up ruminating about an ex with BPD, doing better with someone else, and you feel like you weren't compassionate enough or strong enough to handle a, a personality disorder. Well, nobody is. Frankly, nobody is. Not when they're untreated, you know what I mean? Like nobody's strong enough to handle that in a relationship. It does too much damage, even if they're more on the quiet side and they don't like yell and scream at you a lot, or but they might withdraw sometimes. But I think maybe you're being um, too hard on yourself because I think you might be thinking still, you know, you, you can think about this, I don't know. But from what you said, you might still be thinking that something about it didn't work out because you weren't compassionate enough or strong enough to handle the the person, the personality disorder. And that's not the case either. So you might want to think a little bit more about that, but there is no truth to they're going to do better with someone else because, because of some or a couple of things that you think that you couldn't offer. Because even if you were more compassionate or stronger, not that you're probably very strong, but it, you couldn't change anything. You can't make these people change. You can't get hurt or seen by them. So, and you said that was not their fault. Um, well, everything isn't always the person with BPD's fault, but they have so much responsibility in what they demand and expect and the chaos they create for partners one way or another, very various different ways that they would have responsibility in that. Um, but not responsibility in why they have borderline personality disorder, right? But then that's the other big hurdle for people is that they have to realize once they get into adulthood, because a lot of people, BPD will say, well, you know, it's not my problem. It's not my fault. I didn't ask for it. Well, it's very true. But then when you become an adult, you have to realize that you're going to have to do something about that, even though that is super and I don't use this word much, but people at BPD will say, that's really, really unfair. Not my fault. What am I supposed to do about it, right? 
So um, I just think try to not be so hard on yourself there, Deborah, because I don't think anybody is strong enough or compassionate enough or the people that are, I don't think it's about strength, but uh, the people, it's about vulnerability really, which can be a strength, but can be detrimental to people. And I think that nobody is really in a healthy way able to be compassionate enough or ever empathic enough because you can't fix, change, rescue this person that is going to be relating to you like you're supposed to be the all-knowing, all-meeting, all-need parent. Uh, Nana, well, I hear you on that. Yes, you've always been the scapegoat of the family. And a lot of people with BPD go through that and a lot of horrific stuff in family of origin. So part of the uh, journey there, you know, in getting treatment and working through things is, is also working through that because, you know, I too was a scapegoat in my family. And the good news, not much, but the good news about being the scapegoat is usually people that are or were but remain the scapegoat of the family are the more sensitive people, are the people that care more, are the people that feel more in often families of origin that don't value any feelings. And so you get really scapegoated and put down and pushed aside and worse because you're feeling stuff that nobody else can handle dealing with often. And Derek, is future faking a real thing for people with BPD? Well, again, this is where people are taking what narcissists do, which has a different framework, a different context, and applying it to people with BPD. So I would say generally the people with BPD that don't have any comorbidity with narcissistic traits, no, they're not really future faking. They're actually just trying to make their way forward. And, and they don't know that, like, for example, you know, commitment or even like, I don't know, with a friend saying, yeah, let's go see that movie and it's two weeks away or a month away. And then the closer it gets, the more they're not sure how they're going to feel and the more stress that builds. This can happen in all kinds of, like in relationships in all kinds of different ways. Like often, I've had so many clients tell me and I'm almost waiting for it, but not everybody's the same, right? But when they'll be talking about the breakup, what happened, the situation, it's often when they're just about to move in together into that house, right? That they want... And, and that's the commitment. And that's what just engulfs the borderline and they have to go. Uh, and they don't know why and they push away. So, no, I don't think people with BPD are in any conscious way with any intent. You know, just BPD, I'm saying. I don't think they're really future picking. And you said, I've heard the term used recently, but don't understand if it's a real thing or just something created by folks on the Internet. No, future picking with narcissists is a real thing. Because they will knowingly, purposefully be love bombing, breadcrumbing, all that kind of thing. And then they, they will be faking. They will be making promises that they know they have no intention or even a care in the world to keep. And people with BPD are more or less trying to go ahead with life and what they really want. And then their feelings and their dysregulation and their triggers and their lack of awareness and their lack of self gets in the way. So I think it's kind of different. It can overlap in some if there's overlap of traits. And that's really hard to pick apart, you know, when you're experiencing it in your own life. Um, Dexterity, hi there. Um, oh, thank you for that. I am doing well. Thank you very much. Um, oh, PPD, paranoid. Okay, I don't know. I just haven't seen that for a while. Paranoid personality disorder. Well, yeah, which is, you know very formidable, very difficult. Um, and again, comorbidity with it, well, it can co-occur co with NPD or BPD. I don't know what the instances or how often that is thought to be occurring. But, um, and then, you know, I've, I've met a few people in uh, like years ago in my life, like I had a neighbor that, well, in two different places that told me they had paranoid personality disorder. And they became people to get the heck out of the way of because of just what they manifested. So that's pretty formidable personality disorder on its own. And yes, it can be, I don't know if they say it's officially comorbid with BPD or NPD, but it certainly can be um, part of the picture or co-occurring or whatever the case. And again, when people get diagnosed with both those personalities, I'm not sure. Maybe. 
Um, Dexterity, I'm so upset. She abused my trust and lied constantly. I'm really sorry to hear that, but unfortunately, <coughs> it's because of all the things I talk about in a lot of other videos, right? How they don't know themselves, how they experience the past and here and now unconsciously. I'm not trying to excuse what happened. I'm just trying to explain it, right? That, yeah, you know, the lying constantly. Because you see, now you've lost trust, right? Because of what happened. And that's healthy. And that's to be expected. But she could never trust in the first place. And that's a big issue. Because, you know, and they lie for various different reasons. But they lie defensively. But they can lie for other reasons. And they often end up lying about things because of whatever they're feeling and going through that they don't know what the heck it's about because they don't trust anybody, you know? So even though you're trustworthy, they don't have the ca capacity to trust others or themselves. And MW, I had an emotionally stressful pregnancy. My daughter's a little over two. She is emotionally sensitive, but is an excellent communicator. Oh, that's great. And I try to be attentive to her needs. Well, and I think that, you know, um, with a stressful pregnancy um, and you're really paying attention to your daughter and you see that she's emotionally sensitive and that doesn't have to be bad news. It doesn't have to be because you said she's an excellent communicator and you're trying to be attentive to her needs. And so that nurture, you know, and likely you've done well enough in the first two years of her life, you know, probably done a really good job so that you have a bond. And that's going to make all the difference in the world. And it's really important to pay attention when a child is more emotionally sensitive. But that's not necessarily a big red flag because I think you've been nurturing her all the way along and you're trying to meet her needs and you are meeting her needs. So, and, and that's the thing that can happen with children as well. But when they get appropriate responses from mom, you know, and or dad, but especially mom at that, those young ages, um, it means the world. And it helps children to continue on through the age and, you know, early, early stages of childhood development versus if you weren't giving her that nurture and reassurance and paying attention to her needs and the nurture, it's everything to children. Sounds like you're doing a really good job. Uh, why are narcissistic families so obsessed with money and wealth? Uh, well, because money and wealth brings power and they are power mad. That's one reason. And why is um, their jealousy when someone in the family does become successful and then they'll trash their accomplishments with ease? Well, I mean, I come from the same kind of family you're describing, and I'm sure, you know, no comparisons as to what each of us got to experience out of that, um, like many people. But I think, yeah, I guess in my family, just, well, I don't want to say my family. They're not my family. They weren't my family for like 35 years. Whatever. They're, both my parents are gone now. I don't know where the rest have scattered. Other people have died. I don't know. Who. So po point is anyway, I was going to say the family of origin that I came from too, narcissistic, dysfunctional one. Um, they were pretty, yeah, money. Well, money became their currency of, quote, love, unquote. It had nothing to do with love. But it was about power. And, and I think that they're, often obsessed with that just for the power of it, you know, and, and the status, especially if they're narcissists, um, and the jealousy. Yeah. When someone else in the family, because, because the gel, okay. The jealousy has to do with, and it can be even more than jealousy. It's like, how dare you accomplish anything? Cause you know, if, especially if you're the scapegoat child, right. But then they feel like you're trying to say somehow that you're better than them. They just, you know, in, in a really like ridiculous, crazy, not reality based way, feel that way. So it, it diminishes their ego. If they're narcissists, it makes them feel even less worthy if it's a borderline or if they didn't accomplish a lot. And so, yeah, when, when like an adult child or, or teen and adult child goes on to accomplish something, um, they'll, they'll definitely, you know, whether with ease, but become successful. Yeah. They'll, but, oh, you said they're tr trash the accomplishments with ease because it's what I'm not justifying it. It's horrible. It's what their little inflating egos need so they can feel better. Right. That's how all about them that they are. If they're narcissists borderlines, it's like, um, it might be a little bit different, but yeah, I don't really know how to explain it differently, except 
they just feel worse and worse about themselves and then they feel competitive about that. So they don't, they want to trash any of your success because maybe they feel like it's outshining theirs if they have success. And I mean, and I, I won't go on about it, but in my childhood, I went through a ton of that. And, and where did it start? It started with accomplishments at school. It started with it, it, that they didn't care about that. They wouldn't, you know, like, because I had I still do, I guess somewhere out there, a sibling three years younger than me, Mark golden child. Um, and we have had no contact since 1987. Uh, that's great. Um, bottom line is, you know, like he used to struggle in school and like failed grade four or three times. I don't even know how that's possible, but that, you know, that's him. So he never got any brighter in life. So I hear, but the point is, so he was a golden child though. So that didn't matter. And they were trying to help him, you know, with whatever the problem was. And there I was doing my stuff, accomplishing in school, high marks, doing fine, doing my homework, never getting any help. Nobody get. And the bottom line is, and so when I bring home a, a report card, usually I had too many absences on it for sure, because I didn't really like school. I was always trying to just like, I don't want to go today by the time I got to high school. But I still did okay academically, right? But they would just look at the report card and not look at the, I didn't get good marks and everything like math and science. No, I was an idiot, but I got good marks and other things. But then they wouldn't even look at the marks or they look at the bad marks or the low marks or they look at the absences and they never say a word about the accomplishments because they just can't handle it. Their egos just can't take it. And it's very injurious to, you know, kids and teens. And and then even when you go on and, and then like I had all the success in sports and it was fun. It was great. I mean, it was more important to me because it was fun. And, and you know, I got to know other people. But my parents never gave crap, never saying, I heard my father once brag about some trophies I'd won to someone else, but never say anything to me. So the bottom line is, and then when you get to be an adult and you have more accomplishments, no, they don't see it. And, and I'll just share one thing that my narc mother used to say, well, I was in contact with her for a lot of years, but what she would say to me was like, you know, just question something, whatever. Like, why do I have dogs? They're just going to hold you down. You should have dogs. Blah. Why do I do this? Why am I interested in that? You know, like when I was 15 and having a lot of emotional difficulty with, uh, you know, anxiety and panic attacks around these people. Uh, do you wonder why? I didn't know why. But I said, I really need to see somebody. I really need to go to therapy. Uh, they, they would just thought doctors, lawyers, therapists all pull the crap. You know what I'm saying? So um, they don't make any sense, but they definitely can't handle other people's accomplishments. So whether whether it's BPD or NPD or some mix there, um, when you succeed, it bums them out, right? When you succeed, it affects how the borderline feels about themselves and they feel less than, or the narcissist, uh, the ego starts to deflate because you're doing well. And that is the most childlike reality from these people, but it's very devastating. And of course, it's no excuse for all that either. And MW, I'm raising her with my folks who are also attentive. Um, is she regulated to a life of personality disorders or severe mental illness because of my experience during pregnancy? Well, no, I, I don't think the answer is an automatic yes, that's for sure. Could she be at risk of that? Perhaps. But the thing is, you know, that you're raising her with your folks and you're all being attentive and you're doing the best you can. So I think what maybe you might want to do if you're concerned, and you said, I think that she's two, that maybe, you know, six months or maybe now, but maybe six months to closer to the age of three is, you know, take her to a child psychologist who specializes in just this very thing, right? In a child that's sensitive, that went through something that you couldn't help, right? That could have adversely affected her like during your pregnancy. And so that isn't, so I would say to be extra careful, like you're doing and your parents are doing everything you can. And that's a lot. And that's very important. And then I would say probably early intervention, have her assessed by a child psychotherapist because they do play therapy, right? Obviously they're not going to ask her a bunch of questions, but anywhere from two to three on you, you can, look for a child psychologist who specializes in this area in particular, because 
I'm aware. And, and maybe sometimes it's a social worker. I don't know. But there are places out there or child psychologists that really do. And in, in this sort of how to intervene in the best possible ways, which it sounds like you are doing, but if you want a professional opinion in that regard, then it would be helpful to have your child just kind of seen by someone professionally and you're part of the process. And maybe all they would do is suggest that you're doing really well and they might just give you some other tips on how to keep doing this, doing what you're doing. And the other thing is, and if they saw any significant kind of like concerns, then the child could, you know, it, it's good to get early intervention if you have any concerns. Because I can't give you an ironclad answer one way or the other, but it doesn't have to mean that um, she's, you know, going to be in this headed toward a life of personality disorders or severe mental illness. Uh, the bottom line is, though, like you're doing everything. And, and if she's doing well, I would say within six months to a year or maybe by the time she's three, if you're not seeing anything really concerning right now, because you're, you're doing really well, you're doing all you can do then maybe to just, yeah, have her looked at by a child psychologist and, and just get her sort of the way that they do assessing through play therapy, et cetera. And then they can kind of give you an indication of how well she's doing because maybe she's doing quite well and she's going to be fine, right? So it's definitely not a push the panic button for sure thing, but it's definitely something you want to keep gauging. Her age, the stage of early childhood development she's in, and that's another thing, if you're not aware, and you might be, but Google that, you know, Piaget or Erickson's stages of early childhood development. And then you can kind of read up on that if you haven't already and kind of gauge where she's at and what milestones is she hitting and how is she doing. But don't ever be afraid to get early intervention just in case, just in case. So that's up to you to think about. But because um, there's a lot of people now who work with children who've had some kind of like experience, like, you know, your, your daughter did in, in your pregnancy, which is not your fault or something like that in early childhood even. And so, yeah, they, they work on early intervention to help parents, to help the child as much as possible. And it can mean the difference between someone ending up with a personality disorder or not. Right. But it sounds like you're doing wonderfully, but you might want to just check in with a professional in some period of time, see if there's any other tips and to make sure that things are going well for your daughter. And Yvonne, why do some people with BPD talk like a child? Well, because probably they have it more severely, but also um, <clears throat> there's an age regression that can happen with triggered dysregulated emotion. And it can happen for many people with BPD at different times, but not all the time. And then it can happen to some people with BPD a whole lot more of the time. And, and it's age regression with the dissociative experience that is unconscious, right? Of all that they're feeling and they're overwhelmed by. And because they really are, until unless a lot of therapy or beyond, right? They really are emotionally arrested by or before the age of two. So they have that young, you know, that lack of self. So that ego, you know, the child ego state basically fragments off in the arrested emotional development. So there's really a lack of self, but wherever floating sort of like, it's hard to explain this, but inside, lost inside the person with BPD, then that's the only part of the real self left. And I think often the age regress to that because that is then a separate thing from the false self, the protector self that's usually in the lead because of the lack of self. Hope that wasn't too confusing. Hope that made sense. And um, Sarance a lot. I love your name, by the way. Um, why did my ex turn into a child in the middle of celebrating New Year's Eve? Thankfully, we were back in our hotel room. She was drunk beyond belief. I had to ask security to help me take her up. Well, I mean, getting drunk beyond belief can obviously create more disinhibition, right? That you would already have, because just like I finished saying about the last comment, these people, unless and until they get well, significant or beyond treatment, that they really do that work of finding the lost self and what that really looks like in therapy, especially 
a psychodynamic modality of therapy, then they're not going to know themselves. And, and the fear of abandonment and the fear of engulfment and the anxiety on each end of that and the approach avoidance conflict, it all has to do with the first defense at a young age of splitting. So she was like doubly disinhibited and likely very triggered. And they can age regress with the emotional dysregulation. And or let me just say, even just being super drunk, they could probably age regress as well. And and more so than the average person would be a little nutty when super drunk or just pass out. You can see this sort of like lost little aspect fragment of that child that will come out at different times and sometimes really inconvenient adult times, if you know what I'm saying. Um, And uh, hey there, you said, I was no contact with my ex for over eight months. And she recently broke no contact by coming into my business. She came in to show a picture in my, uh, oh, put, oh, shove, sorry, a picture in your face of her and some guy was this some weird Hoover? Yeah, basically that was a weird Hoover because, you know, the other thing about Hoovers is, sorry, that happened. Not all Hoovers are actually to recontact. I, okay, wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Not all Hoovers are actually because they want to get back with you, right? So that's like a Hoover called ha ha screw you, right? And childish. Uh, so wanting to show you she's got somebody now and what's your problem, right? Which is her mentality. It has nothing to do with you. And um, and I'm sorry to hear that that, you know, so so I, I don't know how you handled that. That would be really awkward and uncomfortable. But again, you know, um, coming to your business is likely a no-no that you need to step up and create some boundaries around. And, and maybe you don't want to call police when she's at your business, but maybe you'd like to go make a report that this is unwanted contact and, and start down that path. Because, um, yeah, when you are no contact and then they, they're coming and giving you unwanted contact in your place of business or if they show up at your home, that's when people have to take action that unfortunately needs to involve the police. So that like maybe like talking to them after, not at work type thing. But, and then a few kinds of those calls usually in most places means you can look toward going to a justice of the peace or court or whatever your system is like, wherever you live and filing for a restraining order. And people really often need to do that because now you don't know if she's going to show up again, because a lot of times, like she could be with this person and that, and then when that falls through and ruptures and that's over, um, is she going to walk into your business again? Is she going to do that again in general? Like you think like, don't they usually do that on Facebook? Anyway, I'm really sorry to hear that happen because you have to protect your boundaries of your business, of your space, of your personal space, wherever you are and of your home. So yeah, that was a Hoover. And actually what I put the word weird in front of it, not really when we're talking about people with BP who are all the same, because not all people with BP will Hoover at all. Many are hovering to get back with you. Many are hovering to have really that recontact. Many hover just to see if you'll answer. And if you answer, then they feel more in control and powerful. And you'll never hear back from them. And in this case, she obviously came to your place of business, which is really violating a lot of boundaries too. And hovered you to go ha, 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 or something really immature like that. I'm really sorry to hear that. But hopefully you just maintain your no contact. And, you know, if you see her walk in your business again, seriously, just go to the washroom. You know what I'm saying? Like anything to just not give them what they're looking for. No words, no reaction, no contact, which is easier said than done. And he said, when does the healing come to conclusion? When can I feel normal in my own skin? Yeah, I saw that you asked a question like that. I'm not sure if I responded. I might not have. Um, yet, or it's hard to respond to questions like that because you know what? I don't know. (laughs) I don't have the answer for you because it depends if you're in therapy. It depends what process you're working in. It depends how well your healing is going. If you're in a process of that, um, and it's different for every individual. So it depends on all those things that you know about that. I don't know about you. Right. So I would say for, for different people, it's various different lengths of time. 
But, you know, if, if you're working in therapy, if you've had therapy, wherever you are with that, and you're starting to, you know, make a lot of progress, as you've stated that you have in comments that you've left on the channel recently, I've noticed. And thank you for the, your participation. And I've responded to some. Uh, then just know, really try to measure more like the progress that you are making and the things that are changing more so than when am I going to actually be where I really want to be, right? Because you will get there, but I certainly can't answer that question. Um, <clears throat> I can't tell you it'll be six months more or a year more or because I just, I don't know enough about you, right? So I can't do that. But try to measure your, gauge that by how you're feeling and how you're doing and the progress you're making. It sounds like you've certainly made a lot of progress. Um, second horizon from promises to lies in the blink of an eye. Yes, very, very much so. And, and very, um, it's so painful, isn't it? Because, um, it doesn't even matter why they do that, but yes, many people at BP are going to do that. And it's very painful. And then a lot of people continue to try to make it work. And really, that's a really big sign that it's already kind of slipping away. But a lot of people don't want to, a lot of people are very much, it's too painful to look at that. And I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, oh, hey, MJ Reynolds. Um, well, hi from Canada to you in the UK. Yeah. Jacob, hey there. AJ, just wanted to say thank you again and glad you haven't stopped making new content on the subject. No, I, I wasn't really going to stop. I think there was a month there where, yeah, I was just like, I don't know, I'm still working hard with clients as I always am. And I think maybe I was working on my podcast a bit. And then, yeah, I kind of just, I stayed away from the channel for a month. And, well, maybe, yeah, I'll just say it had to do something, so, something to do with another YouTube experience in another niche area where, whoa. So anyway. Um, and I just thought, because YouTube, not so much, like, if I ever thought that I had a lot of, you know, difficulty or difficult trolls on this channel, wow, I went somewhere else and tried something else for a while, too. And it's like, no, no, that was, like, way worse. So, yeah, no, I'm not going to be giving up on continuing content. And I have a lot of ideas about different kind of content or how to deepen content or different angles to take with content. Because, you know, it's it's really a blessing and a passion of mine to be working with clients. And when I work with clients, I mean, sometimes it's reading. Sometimes it's looking at other people's comments on channels or well, just getting ideas wherever. It, well, actually, I'm following a couple of people. I won't say who right now, but one has BPD. And you, you can look at lots of things to get ideas, right? It's like, oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. But look at this. This is this. And I can talk about that that way. And there's always things to talk about. And I think the other thing is... um my plan is to start another podcast, which I was planning to upload episodes, uh, you know, cause I probably wouldn't do, I might do some more videos on the camera, but I don't know if people care or not. Like I don't, <laughs> but, um, I was going to do this thing on another channel and I'm not sure if I'll do it on the other channel or not because, you know, building one channel is hard enough or just, you know, it's growing. That's nice. More interaction. That's lovely. But like, so maybe I'll just do this podcast. Like I'm doing the other podcast. And then every once in a while I'll, put an episode up to this channel. So, um, and that podcast, which I haven't started yet, but I got the intro outro done and, and, and I've got one episode recorded. It's just, isn't up there yet. Um, it's called cluster B relationship recovery. So if you want to check out the podcast, if you want to know more what I'm going to do, because the problem with that is for me on this channel, I believe I'm more BPD focused I talk a little bit about that. I could talk a lot more about narcissistic personality disorder, except through those relationships, but there's a gazillion channels doing that. Right. So I don't know, but that's what I'm intending on doing on the podcast. So that podcast cluster B relationship recovery is going to, the first episode should be up. Oh, probably within four or five days. I don't know. As I put I think three up to my <laughs> other podcast recently, I've been doing some things on the channel. So the bottom line is with that podcast, I'm starting off with, it's going to be a little dry, a little repetitive for some people. Um, the one episode I've already uh, recorded is what is borderline personality disorder. And I try to go into some more nuanced things and say some different things and not just a cold, like, you know, here's the traits, blah, blah. But I thought best way to start this cluster B relationship recovery, 
even though a lot of people know a lot about these things, would be what is BPD? So that's episode one. Episode two is going to be what's NPD, comprehensively speaking, right? And I might add in a few other details. And then there's going to be what is histrionic personality disorder? And then there's going to be something a little bit off the beaten path called what is sadistic personality disorder because it exists, but it's not in the DSM-5. And then there's going to be what is the dark triad or dark tetrad. Um, and I don't know if I skipped anything, but bottom line is, so that's how that podcast is going to start. And I have to do the other four, however many of those. And then after that, it's going to, it's going to be really different because I really want to get into BPD, NPD dynamics. What is the situation going on with borderlines and narcissists, but this is separate from why all these borderlines are calling their partners or exes, you know, the like narcissists when it's not true. And as always, I hesitate to mention, so I, I will just refer in general to the YouTuber that never floats my boat, especially on the topic of BPD. Um, I want to talk, because recently they said, as they are known to say crazy things, that really people love, but they aren't the most accurate. That borderlines, this, this other YouTuber quote said, borderlines and narcissists are the perfect fit, unquote. No, they're not. Not by a long shot, but that is the opinion. Or you probably know who I'm talking about. It's the opinion of a malignant narcissist psychopath. So, like, why should we take that seriously? It beats me, but lots of people do. So, anyway, all that just to say, yeah, you know, I'm not going to be done till the damn done, probably. And um, I'm a week away from turning 65. I don't know what we're going to do on that day because I'm like, I guess we have to celebrate that somehow. And it's not a bad thing. And touch what I'm healthy and blah, blah, blah. But, like, I don't plan on retirement. I just don't. I mean, there may come a day if I, like, you know, if the world it, it holds up and, and I stay healthy and I'm, like, 80. Well, I don't know by then. But, like, I got a long way to go yet. And good Lord willing, I got a long way to go. And I got a lot more to say. And too many people chagrin. But what can you do about those people, right? And then Jacob, he said, do you think um, someone with BPD undiagnosed can get triggered more than uh, when they become new mothers. Well, yes. Um, or does having a child possibly help? No, 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 no. It won't help ground them. No, 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 no. Um, because un uh, undiagnosed, so, you know, not treated, right? No, it, it, it won't ground them. It help them grow up in a sense. No, not really. Unfortunately, don't we wish that would be the case? And I think that, um, you know, I think that, I don't know. I never had a child. So let me just straight up put that out there for anybody who doesn't know, because I never wanted to have one. Um, basically trying to break the, uh, you know, intergenerational stuff, family of origin I come from. But of course, the narco and child had to go have two. And one of them is a borderline and whatever. And I, the other one might have escaped relatively healthy. I don't know. I don't know anything about them. But the thing is, um, <coughs> So, yeah, um, I think, so I'm making the statement without never having been a mother. Um, I think mothers are healthy mothers. Um, relatively healthy mothers are extremely ecstatic and happy, but I think they're also stressed and somewhat overwhelmed when they have a child. So, so yes, for people with, um, you know, all the patterns of et cetera, BPD, but not diagnosed and so not treated, Unfortunately, that's going to be like just trigger, 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 trigger more than likely, you know, and, and one thing I can say about that is you might wonder, well, why? Because in an untreated or even undiagnosed person who shows all the signs that they, if they got assessed, they would be likely assessed with BPD, then they have all of this unhealed la emotional landscape of whatever happened in their past, etc., and so it's hard for them to not just get triggered because a baby cries. Now, sometimes they can work with that. And, and, and the other thing is it depends to the, the, the degree to which somebody with suspected BPD or not diagnosed but no treatment is, is, is kind of role reversing from the beginning. Oh, I've got this baby now and they're going to love me. Then that can carry them through some of those triggers. That can help them be a little bit better, but often not quite good enough to stop a child from being psychologically wounded somehow to one degree or another. Um, but yeah, especially when they're younger, sometimes a mother can do better, but 
often they they just they'll get overwhelmed and they'll get so stressed that whatever they do do well or positively will get outweighed in the infant's experience of the opposite if the opposite is occurring too often because when a child like when, when an infant is laying there in front of mom and mom is sometimes maybe really doing okay and mirroring to that child something that feels safe when mom comes in depressed anxious maybe a little bit like moody or angry or really angry, then that's a threat directly to the infant's biological survival. And that gets imprinted on the brain, but the infant wouldn't be able to like think or talk about that, obviously, right? So I would just say that um, a mother in that situation needs a lot of support. And then you have to look to what was their mother like? versus if you're in that situation and what's, you know, like if, if your mother's here, then, then like, you know, how can this mother be supported to the max so that the child can get all their needs met as opposed to however that mother might be doing or might not be doing very well. Um, Jackie, how do BPDs handle having minimal contact with their exes for months? Um, what if the ex reaches out to the BPD after months of minimal contact would it be hard for the BPD? Again, very individual, right? Across all people with BPD. But I think for many of them, when they're not in contact with you, especially if that was their choice, then you're likely in the out of sight, out of mind category, which is a very childlike thing they do as well. So probably not being thought about, probably not, or you probably would have heard from them. And or if they're not engaged with, you know, in any other relationship with someone else. Um, some people with BPD really do handle being alone, really do just kind of shut down, isolate, or cope in other ways. And, and they're not really thinking about you. And then there are people with BPD that they might be thinking about you on and off. Um, and, oh, you said minimal, so you're not talking no contact. Okay. Well... To reach back out, unless there's a child involved, it, I don't know the situation, but to reach back out after minimal contact for months, I guess the question would be why, right? And then because nothing's going to have changed. And um, would it be hard for the person with BPD? Well, it could be, but it could go one of two ways, right? They will either respond or they won't respond. And then two other ways, they can respond and be really cold and distant or they could respond and be like, maybe not necessarily happy to hear from you because they're never happy, but maybe accepting hearing from you. But again, I would just ask you to think about what your motivation is and why you would want to make that contact. And also that, again, you can't coddle a person with BPD. So whatever it is that you feel you might want or need, uh, versus wherever they're at because they're not all the same. So I can't tell you one way or the other how they would react. Just know that often they might respond. They might be in a really cold, uncaring place, distant place. You might be out of sight, out of mind. Not that that's necessarily, the, you know, I don't know, but that's possible. And they have a way of just kind of pushing people away when there isn't much contact. So it's really hard to say how that would be for them, but they'll certainly let you know in a hurry if you try it one way or the other. And then again, what's the reason for wanting minimal, con I mean, for wanting more contact. And Jackie said, why would someone with BPD say we can keep in touch? But then when I reach out, reached out months later, um, she will reply to email nicely, but will not respond to the question of seeing me in person or phone. Um, yeah, because, you know, for some people with BPD and with this minimal contact you're talking about, and you said um, they could reply nicely to an email, but they won't. Okay, but they're not answering. You're saying, hey, would you like to get together? Would you like, um, in person or on the phone? Well, that just suggests to me that they are that you're likely more than not in, in the other side of my place so that they could respond to an email nicely, but they're obviously 
perhaps still experiencing something, whether conscious or not, about a devaluation of you or just a distance that has existed. And they're just not wanting to see you or talk to you on the phone, which is kind of like could be for a myriad of reasons. And the other thing about that is that's kind of like a big red flag for what are you hoping could happen here? Um, because it sounds like they're really not wanting to talk on the phone or see you in person. They can send you a lovely email. So, you know, it, it, it there's some lack of mutuality and reciprocity there. Um, and Matt said to Jacob, my experience with my child's mother, her undiagnosed BPD just got worse after our child. Yes. And that is, that is often the case, but I'm just allowing for the fact it might not be a hundred percent of the pro uh, time, but I'm really sorry to hear that too, Matt. And Jackie, why do people with BPD leave the relationship open? Well, again, they don't all, okay? Some do, because they're not all the same. And he said, I've asked if she wants me to leave her alone. She's never said no, but she will only send me short messages if I reach out. Well, remember that this person with BPD you're talking about, though I don't know much about the situation, is likely not very emotionally mature, probably doesn't know how to say no, except they know how to say no when they explode or implode or withdraw or, uh, you know, rage to value, et cetera. But maybe, maybe this person is rather on, you know, like has quiet BPD. And I think, you know, they don't really know how to communicate very well, even like a, they don't have their own boundaries. So she's unlikely to say, no, I don't want to hear from you anymore or just leave me alone. But in other ways, maybe that's what she is saying. I don't know, right? That's something for you to think about. But if she's only sending short messages, if you reach out, doesn't want to get together, doesn't want to meet on the phone, then it sounds like they just don't know what to do. But it sounds like they've definitely, yeah, they've left it open, sort of. But it sounds like it's really not that open, if you know what I mean. But that they don't know how really to close it off or have closure with it. So you're kind of more or less just hanging there. So, you know, I would just encourage you to think about that because it could be that this person isn't really ever going to warm up or, um, you know, be more communicative, but they're never going to say go away either. So then you have to decide what, you, you know, how is that for you? And sounds like you are hoping that something about that will change. And perhaps maybe you need to accept that whatever the relationship type, um, it's, it's just not going to work out. And so rants a lot. Um, is, quote, narcissistic karma, unquote, real? Eh, you know what? I don't know. I don't get too caught up in that myself. Like, I think it's way overdone on the Internet. I think people are just way overdoing it in their life. Um, I think their ha karma has some meaning for sure. But what would be different about a narcissist karma, except it might be a little bit heavier, yes, what they are earning there, so to speak, horribly. Um, but I don't know that it's helpful to really think about it. But yeah, I tend to think, I guess I don't think about it much, but in thinking about it for a minute, generally I would say that, you know, for, for most actions, not always with the same people, but there's usually an equal and opposite reaction that somebody will reap somewhere along the line. But I don't know that I would just refer to that as a narcissist karma. It, you know, they'll get what they sow, so to speak, I suppose. But it's like just karma, you know, but it's not something I really thought about a lot. And you said, or is it just an explanation for one oneself to soothe themselves? Well, it sounds like it's still a place of some attachment, right? Some modicum of even, wherein somebody is wanting that person to pay for what they did. So there might still be some anger, unfinished business. Because what really is the healthiest thing to get to is neutrality. And as you continue to heal, like, I just give an example. Uh, when I was no contact, which meant 
there was really 10 phone calls between my mother and I in 34, 33 and a half years, which really had purpose to them. Like I was never going after her, pursuing her, wanting anything from her. Um, so anyway, I sorry, just something caught my eye there. Um, what was I going to say about that? Sorry, just <laughs> lost my train of thought with that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I really worked hard to get to a neutral place and it was in therapy as well, but cause I was still in therapy when I did this. So the bottom line is neutrality and not only sort of, uh, sorry, not only gray rocking, cause that's not a long-term solution. It's detaching and healing yourself enough to be able to radically accept what did happen and what, and what you didn't get from them. <clears throat> and to just be able to really move forward as I found I could and, and just don't care anymore what happens to them or if they get their karma or they don't. Right. And you said, I personally don't believe in karma, but there's a lot of content and believers in it. What is your take? Well, I think karma might have some applicability in life. I don't know. I'm not a big, you know, I, I don't ascribe to it. I don't think about it. Like I said, and I think the other thing is too, that, you know, with anyone that's ever hurt me in the past, and there's certainly been more than a few of them, um, and, and the family of origin, like, it's just about healing and letting go. And that's not easy, right? But radically accepting that they have their limitations they do after you've healed enough to do that. And then working in a process to really, and not too early and not too soon, but to forgive them. And you don't forgive them for them. And you don't have to tell them that. You know, forgiveness is a gift that we give ourselves because we don't want them affecting our psychology, our energy, our thoughts, our quality of life anymore. So I think that a lot of people probably are trying to sue themselves. Oh, you're going to get yours. You're going to get your karma. Well, yeah, I think a lot of people do use it as a soothing technique and tool. And, and I don't think there's anything really wrong with that, but I think that people can and owe it to themselves to continue healing, working in therapy or whatever people are doing to definitely be able to let that go. And that takes a lot of work and it's not easy. And remember too, that forgiveness is for you, not them. And forgiving is, is remembering, but letting go when people are ready to let go. And it's a very, freeing and important piece of the work when people get there because it just alluding to my mother again who I'm still working out some things lack of closure but some other things I learned since she died about a year a year a bit ago that um yeah I didn't know how deep this process would be but mother wounds are always the deepest and I'm not like experiencing this in some horrific way it, you know sometimes I'm yeah, I think of something, I remember something, I'm not triggered by it, but it can bring up some pain. And and also in this in this healing recovery process, the thing I'm really grateful for when my mother did pass away, I was waiting for it by the way, but not wishing her to go, you know, but we weren't we weren't in each other's lives. But the thing of it is that when we do our work to get to that neutrality, and I had already forgiven my mother before she died, but um, when we can get there all the way through this process, which isn't about perfection, then we can really deal more effectively and, um, help ourselves in, because basically if we don't work out, out the healing from everything to do with family of origin, parent and ex, et cetera, and or both, then, especially when you think of a parent, when they pass away, they're going to control you from the grave. If you don't get yourself psychologically, emotionally, energy-wise, out of there. And, of course, that takes a lot of work, but that's where the process heads to. Many people are at different stages of their processes, and and that's probably, like, the, the deepest level of the process next to when you have to process um, a death. M mind you, I will say, mother, work is, mother things and work is always the deepest, and um, you'd be surprised even if you, like, I was no contact with her. I accepted everything. I understood it. I didn't expect anything. But when she died, it hit me in a different way. Like, when my father died, I think I 
called a couple of friends. I found out eight months later too. Called up a couple of friends. They weren't home. Took my dog out at the time for a walk in the rain. Had one moment of anger about it. Cried for five or ten minutes. Was out with my dog for a while. Came back. Went, went back home. And then my friends were calling. People left messages. And then this was a long time ago on the old you know, message machines. But the thing is, and then one day I went to, um, he died eight months prior. Yeah, like I said. So one day in, in, in the summer, like eight months, nine months, 10 months after he died, went to, um, yeah, the cemetery and with a friend of mine. And I thought, oh, wow, here's where all the crap's going to hit the fan and I'm going to feel something. I'm going to get overwhelmed or something. It just never came. So actually, like, my experience of when my father passed away 25 years, well, almost 20, no, 25 years ago now, um, was that unbeknownst to me that he passed away because we weren't connected. Because if I'm connected to somebody, I care about somebody, like people and friends in my life, my partner, I would know something's wrong. You know, I have that intuition, but we were so disconnected. And the bottom line was um, he had kind of died to me so many times over in life. It didn't really matter. But we don't really get that kind of. I didn't really forgive him until 10 years after he died. So, like, it wasn't done done. But mothers and mother work is the deepest and that's true in the healing and that's true when people have had a cluster b relationship with a significant other that goes back to a, a cluster b mother um it's going to be the multiplicity of the woundedness in both from both individuals and or for some people more than a parent and more than one partner and Jackie, what are some of the tips uh, for how to talk to a friend helping a loved one with BPD when they are splitting on you? Well, you know what? I don't have a lot of tips in my toolbox or on the top of my mind right now because really to me, no offense to you, Jackie, but that just seems like codependency. It's like, so tips for how to talk to a friend helping a loved one with BPD. Uh, it depends why they're helping that loved one. It depends in, in, you know, what's going on specifically, but, um, when they're splitting on you, essentially it's hard to say that it's always the end of everything, but, um, you really can't help a person with BPD if they're splitting you. So I think the best that they can do is just be neutral, right? Kind of gray rock that try to, um, it, you know, if they're helping them, cause I don't know the whole situation, it could be a health thing. It could be something else. Um, if they're trying to help them emotionally, they're really spinning their wheels. Okay. But if they're helping them with something else, um, they're going to have to go through what they're going to have to go through to do that while they're being split. Because so the only tips I would have is how people approach that, how they need to be more bounded how they need to be expecting more difficulty than not. Um, yeah, basically, because there isn't anything you can do to control how the person with BPD that some that, that a loved one is trying to help or a loved one with BPD that your friend is trying to help. It's really all about self-preservation, boundaries, detachment, uh, and not being reactive. So working on all those things, I guess those are the tips I would have. Yeah. And, um, oh, so this person is pushing them away. Well, it depends what they're helping them with, right? Like if it's anything emotional, if it's still anything to do with a connection to that person, if it's not that they're ill or that they need help in some other way, I would suggest that they might be just codependently overgiving and trying to help somebody who doesn't want help. So it depends again on the situation. But when you're being pushed away and you're trying to help a, a your friend is trying to help a loved one, uh, depending why they're trying to help is the crucial piece of information. They might either have to stop helping, or they might have to get someone else to try to help. Um, the best they can do is take the best care of themselves. If they get to beyond their threshold or limits, so then maybe they can't keep helping the person. And again, it really matters why they're helping them. And I say that because I guess what I'm trying to put across, and it depends on the situation, right, is that 
for all the things out there that say, hey, you know, here's how you can help your borderline loved one, etc. It doesn't work if they're not getting significant treatment. It just doesn't work. And when I was young, my brother would mock me simply for having taken a shower, looking at myself in the mirror and feeling good. I'm sorry to hear that because that that's, you know, great when people can do that, right? Um, he's the original scapegoat. His attitude has not changed. Is it BPD? I couldn't tell you just based on what you just said, if it's BPD or not, but um, obviously it's a person with some issues. Like, I don't, I don't know from what you're saying. Um, but obviously somebody doesn't feel very good about themselves, right? At minimum doesn't have much self-esteem. And so when you were looking in the mirror after shower and, and you were feeling good about yourself, um, then likely it made them feel worse about themselves, right? Which one thing should have nothing to do with the other. So, you know, it could be, but I, I couldn't tell if you, it, I couldn't tell you based on what you just said there. So it could be though but I don't know. Um, Ursel, um, do they BPD uh, need constant attention and think others don't like them? Well, again, they're not all the same. They're all in the same place of things. But yeah, generally speaking, excessive fear of abandonment, um, tremendous rejection sensitivity. So like, I remember something when I was in grade nine and I just got in high school. I was walking down the hall when I was, you know, in my sort of BPD years, so to speak. I mean, like, and I would go through a lot of therapy after that, but I didn't know how I was being affected, but I had abandonment, you know, fears I didn't know about. And I had really extreme rejection sensitivity that I didn't know about because I was just getting rejected every day at home. You know what I'm saying? But bottom line is I remember walking down the hall in grade nine and I said hi to somebody. And they didn't answer me. And I'm like, oh, man, what did I do? I didn't do anything. They don't even like me. I can't believe it. Like, all of that. I didn't do it outwardly, but in, in my own head. And I would never say hello to that person again because I was just so afraid they hated me. And really, when I think back on it, I'm sure they just didn't hear me. You know what I mean? So it's that rejection sensitivity. And, yes, yeah, some people with BPD, if they don't get those replies or the constant attention, then they will think people don't like them. And once they start thinking that seriously, like even that example I gave you, often it goes into the devaluation, all black, painted all black bucket, and never comes out, unfortunately, for everyone concerned. Uh, well, to that question, I would say some people with BPD could end up homeless, just like some people without BPD could end up homeless. But I don't know that there's a high correlation with people with BPD and homelessness. I mean, there might be some in 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 the most severe cases, but I, I don't know about that, actually. So I would say, yes, a person with BPD could become homeless or many people with BPD could be. But I'm sure many other people without BPD could be, too. So but do they sometimes have so much trouble? uh, you know, keeping a job or being responsible or they don't work or they don't have any money. They can't afford a place. Uh, maybe they stop caring about having a roof over their head because it's too much hassle because they can't deal with the authority of the landlord or, or any authority at all. Uh, yeah, that could drive some people with BPD untreated to just totally kind of more or less choose and maybe unconsciously to be homeless. As there are a lot of people who are homeless that have a lot of different mental health struggles. I don't think there's a high correlated factor, though, that because somebody has BPD, they'll end up homeless. But hopefully that answered your question. And dexterity, um, there's a lot of anger. Um, and and is that would that be you feeling a lot of anger, or would that be the person with BPD in your life feeling a lot of anger? I'm I'm not sure. But often there's a lot of anger, enough anger to go around for. People with BPD and people that have been really hurt by them. Um, do uh, do a few weeks ago, okay, my BPD narc mom came to my home and said for weeks how happy she was to see me. Uh, okay, did you believe that? Because, <laughs> you know, I don't know if she was happy to see you or not. What do you think? Like, um, hey there, Mike. I was dating a girl and we decided to end things 
but at times she says something, yes, to lead me on. And then the next day, act as if she didn't say this. I back away, she starts again. Well, and there could be many different reasons for that too, or at least a couple, but she's obviously being very manipulative, right? Very manipulative. And that manipulation might just have the sum total of her seeking and getting attention, right? So it's hard to say, does she ever intend? You said she backs away and starts again. So it doesn't sound like she ever intends to come forward that way. And so she's looking for reaction from you. She's looking for attention. So it's probably important that, you know, you think about, um, oh, so you were dating, decided to end things. Yeah, it sounds like no contact would be your best bet because this doesn't sound like it's a workable friendship. And um, she's being manipulative and wanting attention. And that is push-pull to you and not considering your feelings whatsoever. And um, you call police, she denies the entire experience. Why is this? She's 70. It feels like multiple personality. Okay, well, did I miss something in between? Because I don't know. Um... <clears throat> yeah, I'm not really following you from one point to the next, but um, she denies whatever the entire experience was. She's 70. Um, no, it doesn't have to be about multiple personality. It's really about they just don't take responsibility for anything. And if it was something that you had to call the police for, sounds pretty serious. And she's just going to say, I didn't do that. Or what are you talking about? Uh, so she's just trying to get out of uh, responsibility, basically. Oh, I missed a comment in the middle, did I? Well, that makes sense because it wasn't making. Okay, just a second. Um, I'm not, I'm not, you know what? I don't think that comment came through because I think I don't see anything in the middle. That's the problem. And I think maybe your comment, I believe that you put one through, <coughs> excuse me. It looks like it didn't come through. It might've had too many characters. Wait a minute. Yep. It looks like it didn't come through and that might be the reason because I don't see anything in between, sorry. And I know that's not helpful, but that's probably the comment that didn't make it through. I'm just guessing because of too many characters. Um, oh, you said, I'm so angry that I could never make a real choice because she manipulated me by lying and I realized it was all an act. She was acting out the narrative she built in her head and she was sabotaging me. Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that because that's very painful. And don't forget, so, so it's healthy to be angry. What matters the most is how you cope with that anger, right? Because anger is what we feel often if we don't go right to the amount of hurt and pain we feel by somebody's betrayal like that. And I'm really sorry to hear that happen. But yes, it's healthy to be angry. Just make sure that you try to cope with your anger in healthy ways. And by the way, that might be, I don't know what your situation is, but yeah, hopefully that means that you're not still hanging in there with that person. Oh, you're saying that she forgot something that was major. Well, you know, not to, it depends. You know her, right? So, you know, does she have relatively properly working memory or not? You would maybe know that. You could think about that. The other thing is it doesn't have anything likely to do with multiple personality disorder because let me just say first and foremostly, now known as dissociative identity disorder, it's exceedingly rare. People think that they have it. People act out that they have it. People with BPD will fake it also. I'm just saying it's unlikely that. So you would know to the degree to which her memory is still operational or not. Could it be that? It could have been that. Or it, I think the more likely explanation is she just wasn't going to have anything to do with it because she didn't want to take responsibility. And that's about the best I can do because I don't know more about the situation. Um, I heard you mention brain spotting in one of your videos. Oh, yeah, I think that was a podcast recently. 
um, will you explain what that is? Well, yeah, it's a different way. It's 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 sort of it's better than EMDR actually, but it's akin to EMDR, which is like a different way of processing really adverse experience to you know the capital T word. And there's a reason why I'm trying to avoid these words here. It sounds stupid. Sorry, my apologies. But yeah, it it has all to do with um, as with EMDR, there's different processes, a way to approach it depending where a client is, what they're talking about. Are they feeling it? Aren't they feeling it? So basically what happens in brain spotting is they don't know why it works, but it works. So it gets to the cortical, subcortical level of the brain. Nobody knows why, but it has all to do with this process where unlike EMDR, uh, and when I'm working with clients with this, you have like a pointer and what the client is talking about, what the context of the session is about is really important and or the overall process. And then what happens is sometimes people can't access emotion or memory about certain things, but they're really in a lot of pain and they know that there's something there affecting them or they have this woundedness in their inner child. So what we do is we often, after talking about something a bit, then we start the brain spotting by um, asking how a person is, if they're noticing any tightness in their body or any like lack, not necessarily total lack of feeling, but generally, are you noticing that you're feeling anything in your body? And that doesn't have to be an emotion. I mean, it will be, but they could just identify, yeah, I have a, I have a tightness in my neck or tightness in my stomach or chest, right? And then, so then it's about this pointer that we use and we tip, bring it slowly. In my case, I work with people online, slowly across the screen. Then we'll ask the, the, the client to let me know if and when that feeling intensifies that they've identified in their body. And for some people, it can also be partially a felt emotion, but it, you know, without memory, sometimes people can't feel it. So then we'll do that process. And, and what's happening is they will get to a point where more often than not, that the feeling in the body becomes more obvious, uh, stronger, and it has to do with eye positioning. So, and then at that point, usually asking the person to look at something else or some, you know, putting their eyes in another position to relax if, if it's getting very intense. And then I might give some verbal prompts or the person might describe more what they're feeling in their body. And then sometimes that leads, often it leads people to, to cry, to feel, to, so something has been identified, might not be talked about, might be talked about, might be talked about later or never talked about, but it's an identification, identifying of adverse experience and the tracks in the body and or still that are in, in people's psyche or, or emotional reality. And then it can be a release of that without kind of understanding, talking about it or relying on a memory or, well, when my mother or father did this and I was this old, this happened. So it's, it's a really excellent way, another way to access and help people to actually start to heal and clear out feelings, whether they actually end up crying about it or have any memory of them at all. So that's just a brief explanation. It's fascinating. Um, when I was being trained how to do it, I had my own experience as we practiced on each other. It was fascinating and it really does work, but I don't think I did it justice in that explanation. But the point is that they don't know why it works. We just know that it works. It's got nothing to do with hypnotizing anybody. It's a different process in EMDR. And the people that have, um, I don't want to say created it, but come upon this methodology, um, they were master um, EMDR therapists. And they too would say, as I would say, because, you know, I've done EMDR and I've had EMDR in my past, that brain spotting is way more effective even than EMDR. So maybe not all people would agree with that, but it's just an adjunct. It's not a methodology I use with every client, but it's an adjunct that is there to use with clients under different, various different circumstances. Because I have a lot of clients that will work through things that have memory or feeling and viscerally can 
get in touch with emotion and that and make the connection to the wounded inner child. And it can be a very emotional process. And sometimes, you know, doing it in a different way, like brain spotting is really more helpful because like an example, uh, like I have clients who also like might have Asperger syndrome, for example, and in, in males in particular, it varies the, the degree to which that affects them. But I've had clients where they just will not be able to access feelings. They will not cry. They just, it's just not the way that their brain works. So this is another good methodology for someone like that. So there's all kinds of different clients where it's more applicable than others, but that's a little bit about it. And, and I find it's very effective and very, very helpful. Um, dexterity. She was a self-fulfilling prophecy. She knew she was going to, yes, and unfortunately treat you terribly and destroy the relationship. And instead of telling me, she tried to manipulate me into the bad guy so she could be the victim. Yes, this is very, very common. And again, even though they have this knowing, and, and a lot of them don't, but some of them do, and she had this knowing because maybe she's just been through it enough times to realize that's how it goes, or maybe she has a little more awareness, but they don't have that emotional maturity to actually communicate these things, right? Which again, doesn't excuse anything, but this is why so often when they're triggered, emotional dysregulation, or they know something's not going to work out, whatever the case, that they will definitely not respond to you, not hear you, not talk to you, not tell you something like that, or in um, a trigger dysregulated, you know, emotional episode, and they start yelling at you or whatever, as like, you did this, and you're making me feel this, and you're like, I don't even know what day it is now, because this didn't happen. Well, when all, when those things happen, then they are very manipulative. And again, it could be unconscious, but still, it wasn't in her case, was it? And it's not excusable but they simply don't have the skills to communicate what they really need to communicate. They don't have the confidence. They don't have a sense of self. And this is just, again, an explanation, not to excuse it. But many a person with BPD, as do narcissists in their own way, and, and even in different ways, they will definitely provoke, manipulate, provoke the other person into the bad guy role. And then it's like, because the second you have a feeling or the second you even have a moment of frustration, let alone if you get angry, which is, you know, like calm and then not terribly unhealthy to get angry. And then they'll go, oh, look at you, you, you know, and then like it just reinforces that they are feeling like you victimized or like you're victimizing them even more, which then seems to, yes, fulfill the prophecy, as you said, that this is how she was feeling, whether she knew it or not. I mean, she knew about the relationship, what you said there, but whether she knew that she was going, yeah, she did. She did. They don't always, but she did. So she decided that, yeah, she would manipulate you, maybe blame you for something. However, she did that. And then she would definitely um, get you into a place because nobody's perfect, right? Everybody has limits. And when you're getting manipulated, you're being provoked and or manipulated. You're getting hurt. People are going to say stuff at some point. And then it's like, see, look what you're doing to me. Yeah, it's terrible. I'm sorry that you went through that. But that is extremely, unfortunately, exceedingly common. And you said, no, broke up three months ago, minimal contact. She has poor memory and dissociates. Well, I'm, I'm glad for you that you said, no, broke up three months ago. And then, you know, it's up to you, of course, but might wonder why the minimal contact, you know, maybe you have a good reason. Maybe that's going to change. Uh, just be careful with that, that you don't let her give you too much um, contact. I'm just checking something else here. Don't see. Nope, it wasn't that. Okay. So, uh, just a second here. I have to put the glasses on. Take the glasses off. Where was I? Um, so, yeah, I'm glad that you uh, broke up. And, um, and, again, minimal contact. If there's no child involved you know, might not be the healthiest thing because it can turn into more contact. Um, Whitestone, can you go back and read my comment, AJ? Uh, just a second. I don't think I saw a comment from you before. This is what I don't like about streamers. It's really hard to know where the heck you are. Um, 
Whitestone, I don't think I've seen you before this comment. Just a second. Okay. Let me just take a second to take the glasses off again. Because I have this uh, going on a phone too, in case I have to do something with a, you know, somebody who needs to be ejected immediately or something. By the way, I don't know if anybody's interested in being a um, moderator here, but I am looking for one or two because I don't have any. Because <laughs> I haven't been live streaming. Let me see. Whitestone. I'm going to look back. Um, oh, okay. Actually, you know what? My phone hid that. That comment was hidden, and I just saw it on my phone. So you said um, that you just got discarded again. She projected a bunch of mean stuff onto you and blocked you on everything. I'm going no contact and welding the door shut. Well, good for you. I'm sorry to hear that happen, but good for you. Yes, and I see your comment now. And, it might, and I don't think it's showing on the stream here comments, but yes, I just saw that now and pushed show because... For some reason, YouTube has its own things that it holds, right? It's not me doing it. So discard it again. Um, well, good for you for taking care of yourself and welding that door shut. And then, you know, what you do, what you might think that you need or not, you know, in the way of like working with someone, working through this, and really, you know, if you identify with codependency, how can you really heal from this in a way that you'll never encounter it again. So yeah, I did find your comment. I'm really glad, uh, Whitestone. I'm sorry that it got hidden and then I pushed show and then I had a, yeah, so I apologize for that because I certainly didn't see it prior or I would have responded to it. And dexterity. She used me to cheat on her boyfriend and led me on, led me on emotionally. Uh, Oh, I don't care about that. Sorry, messages on phones. I mean, I don't, and not that I don't care. It's not urgent. I shouldn't have said I don't care. That was not right. So she used you to cheat on with her boyfriend and led me on emotionally to boyfriend, girlfriend, but was using me for my body. She assaulted me trying to get me to, oh, wow, but you wouldn't do it. I'm so sorry to hear that because that is vicious manipulation, right? That is maybe, well, that's exploitation as well. It's not only manipulation that, yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that. And, um, and, and, you know, like kudos to you and to most people who will not respond to that, but I'm so sorry that she did that to you because there's nothing appropriate about that for sure. Well, that's good that you went no contact at that point. Absolutely. I'm so sorry to hear that happen. In Whitestone, um, Oh, it, okay. No, well, you know, I can't scroll back up now, but I got it, right? I did get it. So um, I'm probably behind. And so, you know, uh, every time I think I'm at the bottom of this thing, I'm not. Maybe I am right now. But yeah, so I did see it and I did respond to it, right? So thank you for trying to help me with it, though. But problem is I don't see that till later. Hey there, Jocelyn's mom. Um, you've been watching for um, a video or live. Well, this is the only channel unless I, because I repurposed the other channel to Cluster B Relationship Recovery. And if I put anything on that channel, that's what's going to show up because I'm out over there. I'm totally out because, you know, it's the YouTubers. I'm not going to say about all of them. Most of them show themselves in the live streams are exceedingly unhealthy. And then they were all attacking each other and whatnot. And, you know. Um, and I just, uh, like, my reason for being there, which I believed in and I wish I could still do, uh, there's no freaking way I can handle that level of drama, that level of people not being well, that level of, you know, I just can't. There's no way. And so um, I, I miss it. I miss some of the people like you and others over there. But, uh, yeah, I'm out. I'm out permanently. I will not change my mind this time. But it's always nice to see people from over there, so to speak. Um, yeah, white zone. You said, glad you read my comment. Um, weird that it was hidden. It was probably just a word you used that YouTube didn't like. And, and it had nothing to do with me. And as soon as I saw it on my phone, I pushed show. So I apologize for that. Um, well, you know, Justin's mom, I'm, I'm not going to say anything to impugn anybody. Right. And I respect you. 
I just think that for a lot of the viewers too, and the live streaming and the hanging out in the chats, and and I did long ones at a time too, and other people, and I'm not saying anything to be against anyone. You know, I, I look back once in a while at certain YouTubers even, I can see the toll it's taking on their mental health. It's just, it's just visceral, but I don't want to say anything about anybody because it's their business. But I think a lot of people, you, you know, a lot of people have been more invested over there for a long time than I was. Um, but I just know, like, for me, it, it's just great not to be there. And of course, when I was trying to do the videos, et cetera, it just became so time consuming and I just really don't have the time, but I peek once in a while. I kind of keep up with it, but I just watch her channel. I don't watch reaction channels. I don't have time for live streams, but you know, it's, it's a fascinating study. And I understand why a lot of people really enjoy, um, you know, seeing what's going to happen next and, and, and all of that. So, you know, um, please don't think I'm judging anybody and I always like it when people pop by from over there, over here. And, uh, I've had a few comments or people have been, well, not begging, that would be inappropriate, but really wanting me to come back and stuff. But you know, no, nah, it's just not for me. So I think, um, everybody else gets to throw around all the labels, but if I use one, you know, all heck breaks loose. <laughs> And then the whole thing that happened with that one dude that's still going through whatever they're doing over there. Um, by the way, since I'm on this channel, I can I can just say that other dude was absolutely a covert narc. So just saying that is, is, is. And um, gaining ground can try to go at him forever, but gaining ground doesn't know how to do it. And the best way to deal with that guy is maybe talk about some of those things, but don't keep beating him at the same time. So, and, and I guess they're having more trouble over there because there's less of her content. Right. So anyway, um, it's a delight to be out is all I can say for me. And, um, he said, there's evidence of clear financial abuse by my mother has been, oh, that she's been inflicting on your step siblings for years. Yet no one is doing a thing about it except me who left family. Why do they still believe her? Um, uh, let me think clear financial. Yep. Inflicting on them. Well, you know, it sounds like you must be a lot stronger than they are. Right. And you're much more aware for whatever the reasons are that they're not that way. And they're probably afraid to rock the boat. And they're probably thinking that if they keep they just keep turning a blind eye somehow there'll be something for them in the end, which of course in two ways seems clearly impossible. Right. So it's really hard. Like, why do they still believe her? It's, it's however they've been wounded. It's whatever mental health challenges they're carrying. And it's like, they're likely enmeshed with her and they just don't have your awareness. They just don't get it. And they don't know even if they do understand something, they're just locked in. They don't know how to get out and maybe they're not even aware, but I would just say, be careful in terms of the fact that, you know, if you care about that, that's understandable, right? But you can't rescue them either. And, and if there's a way you can put a stop to what she's doing ethically and legally, then yeah, you probably, that's a responsibility maybe to take on, but otherwise, be careful of not trying to, you know, codependently rescue anybody else or fix what she's up to if it's really not that fixable, as horrible and as that is. Uh, hey there. Um, why would a person love bomb you before discarding you? Well, because it's all about them. It's all about what they need. It's all about uh, the attention they want. Uh, if it's a person with BPD. Um, narcissists want attention too, but they want more supply. People with BPD aren't exactly looking for supply. It's, it's more like validation and trying to ascertain some identity through you in an unconscious way. So they do that before discarding you because it's, it's, it's all about them. So for people with BPD, it's validation. It's not feeling alone. It's seeking identity through you all unconsciously for narcissists. It's generally speaking, that they, their ego is just starting to deflate somewhat and they need to inflate it more so they can feel better about themselves. And in either case, with a borderline or narcissist, neither one of them are thinking about you at all. That's the really honest truth. 
they just are all about themselves. And false self, defensiveness, coping, you know, maladaptive coping mechanisms, but none of it justifies how they treat you. But they simply aren't focused on you. Even when it seems like you are everything to them, it's just not true. And the reason it's not true for borderlines tends to still differ, you know, reasonably, you know, still discernibly from the reason that narcissists do that. And you said, isn't that at the beginning of the relationship? Yes, it is. If the relationship is going to fully develop before one gets discarded uh, or develop more, shall I say. And you said, my wife loved bombed me for a week, then suddenly discarded me in the morning out of nowhere. Well, I'm really sort of hear that because, and again, I don't know if she's a borderline or a narcissist because it, make, it makes a difference, but um, the love bombing might have been about the fact that they they knew they were going to move on or however they would frame that in their mind or they, I don't know, right? I don't want to put this in your head. They might have been monkey branching. I don't know. Um, they might have just known that they were going to need to get away, right? Whether that was just a push away or something else. And I see you have another comment. So I'll see what else you, what else you said. After eight years, literally Wednesday night, I was the best husband ever. Thursday morning, I was the worst. It's wild. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that because it, yes, it can just after eight years, who's expecting something like that to happen, right? And then how to even explain that? This, but but it sounds like she probably had a lot of episodes. I don't know if she's a quiet borderline. Sounds like she had a lot of quiet episodes within herself that might have been hard to handle, or you might have experienced other things from her. But you know, invariably what happens is when they're starting to feel they can feel different things, right? Was this like intentional? Was she knowing what was it? Whatever motivated the reason to need to discard and push away like that, which I'm not justifying um, for her at all, they often get really close. And then the engulfing anxiety with whatever else has been going on just overwhelms them to this break point of devalue and discard. And they may not know why, but like that's horrible. And so they often will have this pattern. I've heard this a lot, even people with BPD, where they will get closer and everything seems like it's going fine or it's been better than it's been for a while. And then boom, they're gone. And that is mind boggling, so wounding, so painful. I'm so sorry to hear you going through that. And, and she may have had a reason that she knew about or she may have not had a reason she knew about it all, but it was all based on feelings. And that could have been building over the course of those eight years, believe it or not, because people with BPD are so different this way. And it's really harder to explain it, to be honest. I mean, I would have to like be working in sessions with someone to be able to really hear everything and know everything. And then maybe I could say a whole lot more, but it's, it's really difficult to explain what might have motivated that, right? And so when I work with clients, and I'm not hinting, but I'm out here if you'd care to talk to me. But the thing is, when I know more about it, I can usually help people understand more what motivated it, which can be somewhat helpful, but still, I'm really so sorry to hear that. And I think too, that while you're in this pain, probably still shock, you know, then, then the next question comes up, like, is she going to come back? Is she going to undo that? What's going to happen next? And how do you feel about that? And what do you think you need to do? And that's a long time to be in, in a marriage and with someone. I'm really just very sorry. I don't have a lot else I can really say generally about that. And Sir Rancelot, my mom, <coughs> excuse me, is undiagnosed covert narcissist and a bit of BPD trait. Yeah, just a second. I got to get a drink of water here. <clears throat> Hopefully my throat doesn't go bonkers anymore, Nat. Give it a second. Um <clears throat> pardon me. Um that sounds exactly like well, I think my mother got diagnosed at one point, but it sounds a lot like my mother anyway. And the thing that I always say to people is, you know, 
within reason and with the patterns and the experience and the pain, you know, you know what you know. And they don't always have to be confirmed, diagnosed for it to be exactly what you know it to be. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. It is very painful and it is very sad. But again, you know, people can heal and recover and, and have amazing trajectory. I'm just living proof of one person. There are many more people out there doing it too. And I think you're making your own progress as well. So keep working on that. Um, Jocelyn's mom, sorry, Jocelyn's mom. I had gone no contact with my sister for a year and a half. She wrote me that she needed family and we should forgive and forget. I had been doing that for decades. Wow. And I see you have another comment coming up. So hopefully you maybe say something about how did you respond to that? Jackie, what are some tips to stop ruminating thoughts about a BPDX? Well, um, <clears throat> basically the one that I can give kind of more succinctly that can help people, but it's still a struggle is just trying to use mindfulness to scribe. And no, I'm not treating you like you have BPD. It works for everybody. Uh, rarely it works. It doesn't work so well for a lot of people with BPD. But so when you're having a ruminating thought, there are many other tools and techniques to use, but this is the fastest one I can explain. And maybe if you tried, it will help. Mindfulness to scribe just means that when you start to ruminate about the BPDX, that you look at something wherever you are, like if you're at home, maybe you're in your living room, maybe you could look at a lamp and just, and you can do this out loud if you're by yourself or at home, just start to describe that lamp. And this might sound crazy, but if you start to describe the shape of, you know, the, the shade, the lampshade, you describe how do you turn it on? Is it like, uh, you know, does it have a dual light, triple light, whatever you call those things? Or is it just you turn on the lamp and it's, you, you do you push the button in? Do you turn? And you just start describing all this stuff. And if you have to do this and you're like not alone or whatever, then you do it in your mind. Just describe something and visualize it and totally focus on it. And guess what? In the beginning, when you do this, it might last for two or three seconds. You will forget about your ex, the rumination. But the more you practice it, the longer that you will have pauses between ruminating thoughts. And then that is the start of where, if you're not working with somebody, it would help to work with somebody to go into this more in depth to really get to what is causing the continued rumination, what is still there that needs to be healed. But in terms of just trying to, and then if, you know, are you uh, experiencing any limerence or not? Because people that are limerent, uh, they, they will have a harder time stopping the rumination. But just describing an object, either in your mind or out loud to yourself, the no matter how smart we are or think we are, our brains cannot do two things at once. So ruminate about the X and describe a lamp or a view out your window, or a tree, or whatever it might be. So if you try that, it might give you a, you know, it might give you a bit more of a break, but if you do it for 10 minutes, it might give you a three minute break. But the thing is, it's a way to start practicing, you know, intentional focus on describing something that will start to give you more pauses and breaks in between the rumination. It's not entirely you know, the, the way to get through the rumination and totally eliminate it, but it can be very helpful to people. And, and there are other tools and techniques very similar, but uh, being as I'm in the middle of a live stream, hopefully that you might try that. It might sound silly, but try it because it really can help over time. And Jocelyn's mom, um, I saw her at a funeral recently and we were cordial, but I hesitate to engage again. I suggested therapy together, but she was resistant. Well, and you know what? Like, I think that, you know, your hesitancy to engage again is probably what you really need to listen to the most. And with your experience, you know, you can think about that and, and the amount of years that have gone by, et cetera. And the other thing I would suggest for you to think about is that when you suggested therapy together and she was resistant, you might end up being grateful for that because as much as you might want to have a repair in the relationship, she first needs to repair more things on her own for that to be able to happen. 
And, and really with somebody with BPD, going to any kind of joint or your know, therapy together is really not going to be as helpful as people think it is. Because when she's resistant, there's reasons why she's resistant. There's reasons why, you know, you're hesitant to engage again. And rarely are those, is there a bridge built in any kind of joint therapy in any relationship type? Because the person with BPD has to clearly work through what they don't understand about themselves first to be able to then build a bridge back to you that you could count on or trust or even invest in being the person on the other side, creating your side of that bridge. So just, you know, food for thought on that, because suggesting to go to therapy together is unlikely to be very successful until she does more to help herself or get help for herself. Hi there, Brian. Um, you said, thank you for your videos. Can you explain why therapists, friends, and family often dismiss the effects of cheating and BPD emotional abuse in validating the depth of our feelings? And yes, can I explain all of that? Um, huh. Not really in total, but I will just say that there are a lot more therapists out there, unfortunately. And I'm not here to say, well, I'm uber great at it and everybody else sucks. No. There are a lot of competent therapists out there, but there are a lot that aren't competent and they're in over the heads and they don't really have the expertise in this area. And the other thing is there are m many again, and I don't know if this would be the situation that you encountered at all, if, if that's what happened. The thing is that there are many therapists that have BPD and maybe to varying degrees of having had treatment or, you know, <laughs> doing well or not doing well at all. And so why do I mention that? Well, because it's true. And secondly, it can lead them to side with the person with BPD. And the other thing is if they're not truly expert in this area, or even if they are, but they're inexperienced or they're just missing something when they dismiss the effects of friends and family, right? Of somebody with BPD, the way they treat you emotionally, and the effects of cheating. Because you know what? Effects of cheating, whether someone has BPD or not, very serious, needs very in-depth work in therapy if there's any hope for working through that in time. And with a person with BPD, that's really unlikely to happen because they don't trust, they repeat patterns, and all the therapy in the world, they probably won't get the message that way because they need more of their own treatment. But that invalidating the depth of your feelings and your horrific experience is inexcusable. So I really don't know why, like if it happened to you, I've had people report like clients tell me about other people, they whatever, sometimes using names, sometimes not, but I would never divulge that. But they've had terrible experiences with other people. And I just think it's somebody doesn't get it or somebody's being protective of the person with BPD for some crazy, like, non-excusable reason. It just comes down to um, unprofessionalism, malfeasance, and doing harm, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not a person who knows what they're doing. And I'm so sorry to hear that happen because, you know, like, I work with people on both sides of this fence. And even sometimes I will, I won't do joint very often. It depends. It has to be a really specific situation. But I have worked with clients, you know, who come to me first and then, you know, whether they're finished totally or break up totally with the ex or is it the ex or isn't the ex and will they do sessions? So I sometimes get into and have clients like that right now where I'm working with sort of both sides, so to speak, at the same time, but protecting the confidentiality of each, of course. But the bottom line is, the more that I have done that kind of work, the more it is incredible to see that, like, I, I, I don't invalidate the person with BPD in their sessions, and I don't invalidate the codependent in their sessions. But the bottom line is, you know, you just, like, it's, it can be a very difficult place to be when, when you're not making progress often with the person with BPD, et cetera. But the bottom line is, even, even when I've done the odd and it's a really specific situation, working with somebody with BPD and an ex or in different relationship types together, which is not highly recommended, those processes usually break down.
because I will not take one side or the other, and I will not defer to what a person with BPD can't handle to hear, though I have to handle that very gingerly, but I will not defer to that and invalidate the person on the other side of what's happening. And so then that becomes an exercise in trying to very gently, very, you know, however roundabouty sort of, so to speak, that I have to say something to a person with BPD. And that's usually where the process breaks down because I won't take one side of it. I see both sides. And then I can see where one side maybe needs to work on it more than the other side, or it's never going to. And then when I have to communicate that in a very careful, you know, you know, really careful way, that isn't like the whole nine yards. Often that's where the process breaks down right there because then they won't trust me anymore. And how dare you? And they think I'm taking the other person's side and et cetera. So, you know, but a lot of therapists are failing a lot of people and I'm hearing a lot about it. And I'm really sorry to hear that happen to you. And it just, again, you know, people have to be really careful who they choose to work with, you know, and I'm out here to work with people if I resonate with people. And, and the only thing I, I'm saying that for right now is not to compare myself to anybody else, but the process, I think people get some opportunity to kind of know me a little bit or how I work a little bit or how I think or how I'm going to approach things. And, and so, it, you know, I might not resonate with you and I'm not trying to say this directly to you, but just in general, um, like not directly to you, Brian, but in general, I think that's why a lot of clients come to me because I've had clients say, well, <clears throat> I've had some say, I watched your videos five years ago and I hated everything you had to say. And I was like, ah, and we're ready to hear it. And then they come back or I've had clients and, and then they watch for like a week, uh, like weeks, months, maybe a year or more. And then they book sessions or I've had clients say, yeah, I've been, I just found you and watched like 50 videos already. And I know I got to work with you. Or sometimes uh, they watch for one to three. I've, I think I've had a client say they were watching on off for five years before they decided to work with me. And maybe they, was, they were working with someone else in the meantime too. And maybe that was helpful to a point. And then they wanted something different, or maybe it wasn't helpful. But the bottom line is, I just say that for anybody contemplating potentially working with me, if I resonate with them, that yeah, being here on YouTube and not only in a live stream, but in any way, I think it gives people a little bit of feel of like, you know, like for example, what you're talking about there, Brian, would never happen on my watch is all I can really say about that. Right. And I'm just really sorry to hear that it happened to you. It happens to so many people. You're not alone, but the other thing you might want to consider, depending what happened is, you know, putting in a form of complaint against that person because it, it's not professional. It's not acceptable. It's not okay. Um, Sir rants a lot. Oh, thank you very much for that. Um, super chat. I'm never sure if it's a sticker or a chat, but thank you so much. That's very kind of you. And you say good night, AJ. Um, thanks for your time and wisdom. Peace to all. Well, thank you so much, Sir Rancelot. I hope that you have a very good evening, night, whatever time it is, wherever you are, or day. Um, Jackie, how are BPDs in long-term marriages or relationships? <laughs> yeah, I thought somebody was going to ask that after somebody else shared. Um, do they show them that behavior or do they try to cover symptoms? It can vary is the answer. And people can be in long-term relationships, marriages, or relationships where there are um, episodes, maybe not as often, whoops, I didn't even touch that. <laughs> Stop that. What is this thing doing? There are episodes that will happen that might be as horrific as, as people have experienced or could imagine. And then people just keep carrying on. And that speaks to somebody with really severe codependency as well, uh, often. And the other thing is sometimes with the quiet borderline, I'm even surprised sometimes when I hear, but I've been through it myself. Like when I had a quiet BPD X, the one that took her life in 2018, I mean, everything was shocking about that, but I hadn't, it's a little embarrassing to say, but I hadn't even ascertained. I didn't even realize she was really a quiet borderline because we didn't live together. It wasn't in a codependent role. There was a lot of like, yeah, moodiness and changing plans and canceling stuff. And I would just like, I'd get a text message and I'd be like, okay, whatever. And I'd go on with my life. But then, yeah, I did sort of got, came, you know, I started to realize stuff and then what happened happened. But 
So with a quiet border on, there can sometimes be over a long period of time, they will internalize it. They will withdraw. Some don't always withdraw in this like where it really totally feels like the silent treatment kind of way. They just really keep it inside. And, and so that's one explanation. But there are other dynamics and, and people with more severe co codependency or sometimes people with BPD even just don't get as triggered as often for periods of time in a relationship. But it, it, it is hard to explain because it, it speaks to the vast difference of people with BPD, that they are not all the same, that some will be in a relationship or a marriage for several years, and, and, and they're unlikely to repeat that, by the way. The relationships, once, like if a marriage breaks up or a long-term relationship breaks up, they tend to then get shorter and shorter as they go. But um, so sometimes there is that type of behavior. Sometimes they are able, the, the quiet borderline covers a lot of things. I've had lots of clients say, I don't know, I got discarded. I didn't even know what was going on, and I never even knew. So, you know, it, it's the vast different presentations or manifestations of the core woundedness of BPD in those patterns because they don't all come out the same way. Then there's probably other uh, reasons why marriages. I, I had a client a few years ago that marriage was ending. His wife with BPD was adamant at one point in time, all of a sudden after 25 years. And like the person who commented earlier said, all of a sudden after eight years of marriage, one day, the greatest thing, boom, next day she's gone. And without knowing more, you know, to say more about it, I really work with clients in this. We can go much more in depth because I'm getting all the specifics, right? So I have to be very general here. But um, yeah, it can sometimes be that there was really egregious behavior off and on, and people just try to work with that. And, and honestly, some men stay in these marriages, especially but relationships for some of them will sacrifice to stay, to be there for their children until they're 18. So that's another reason why relationships can be longer, but most people with BPD aren't going to be in those type of relationships or marriages, but there are some. And so there's many variables. <coughs> And well, a week later, she said, quote, we can be friends, unquote. Oh, my, my. I found out she cheated here in the city and even flew out of state to cheat. No explanation or attempt to speak about it. So sorry to hear that because, yeah, like when I mentioned that it could be the monkey branching or like it could be cheating, I didn't want to kind of want to say that in case it wasn't, but really sorry to hear that. And, you know, and that's really when it's unfortunate that after so much time, right, but that has to be a deal breaker because I don't know how anybody could, you know, how can you be friends and how can you come back from that? Because she would have so much work that she needs to do or how could you, I don't know that she could change that. Yes. It, well, it sounds like it likely was monkey branching and I'm so sorry to hear that. And again, right. I mean, in general, like, you know, in sessions I can help people, but in general, I couldn't say why that would be, right? But there might have been signs that you didn't see. There might have been something you saw, but you you couldn't have you couldn't have expected or or known what was gonna happen at all. And this is when people, you know, because here you are in this live stream right now and you know what you know because this happened to you, and you're probably very much inquiring to what was that? And I'm really sorry because you know, it must be tremendously painful you know, as if you don't know, of course, you know, and you said, could her mother be a narcissist? Well, possible, but I have no idea, but yeah, that's possible. And you said, she's always tried to impress her. Her mother also told her to divorce me and she started cheating immediately after nobody believes me, but she listens to everything. Ah, I, well, you know, somebody commented similarly on the channel recently, but I don't recognize your username. I just want to tell you first and foremostly, I believe you. I hear you. And her mother, yes, it's more likely that her mother could well be a narcissist when I read the rest of your comment. So she's always trying to impress her, which means that, well, this would explain why she has BPD, because she never really was validated, seen, heard, etc. Still trying to get that from her mother that she probably has never really gotten. 
And her mother told her to divorce you. And then she started cheating immediately. And, and I believe you. And she listens to everything her mother says. I believe you. I've worked with clients before where this is the case. There's another person that commented on the channel recently, something very similar as well. So the best I can do here for you, I'm sorry for your pain. I'm sorry for this just happening to you. But I can at least tell you, I absolutely hear you and believe you. And I'm so sorry. Jackie, in your videos, when you say that BPD don't know why they feel the way they feel, <clears throat> excuse me, does that also apply to people with BPD who are therapists, psychologists? Yes, if they haven't been adequately treated, if they're not like healed and recovered or far along the way there, then yeah, that would apply to people with uh, who are working in the mental health profession uh, with BPD as well. Um, because it, it's like, I can't say for sure, but like I do have clients that have told me things that indicated to me and as they said they believe that a therapist something like what um how do i say your name Sayon, i'm not sure has been describing and what, and what brian just no sorry what brian described um this is something that you know could be for that reason could be for other reasons like just lack of knowledge and lack of expertise but um yeah so when i say that people with bpd when they're untreated, especially, et cetera, really don't know why they feel how they feel. Yeah. If they're untreated and believe me, there are many that aren't well treated or they're maybe not treated at all. They go into mental health profession, uh, in whatever capacity, social work, psychologist, who knows, maybe even a shrink or two or more shrinks too, I think, um, because they want maybe to help themselves, but then some just never take that journey. Right. So yeah. Um, I've had clients that have, worked with um, what they have deemed and told me plenty of things about how the therapy went, w you know, a narcissist, uh, you know, therapist, for example. And it's really, really um, painful stuff. And people get really hurt, unfortunately, by these mental health professionals. Um, oh, Irene, take care. I didn't know you were hanging out. That's cool. Um, you're always welcome. The topic's just different. <laughs> Take care. Um, James, hello, AJ. Thank you. Oh, hey, James. Um, in my case, I was one who was fleeting because I lived with her and I couldn't take the anger. Shouted at um, and her never to understand and rationalize because usually they leave. Yeah, and that's very difficult too. And I just wanted to say, by the way, when, when I say, hey, James, it's just because James comments a lot on the channel and I recognize James. Okay. So just know that, and I'm not working with James, but if I was working with somebody and I go, Hey, so-and-so I would never let you know if I was working with somebody. So I just want to be clear. James is not a client of mine. And I go, Hey James, so familiar because James has commented a lot on the channel and good, always good to see you James on the channel. And Jocelyn's mom's, Jocelyn's mom, oh, I'm trying to add syllables or letters in there. He said, wow, that is pretty much the, the scenario I had about working with a therapist and my sister, but it seemed worth a try. I didn't expect her to accept. Well, and the thing is, you know, as much as it would seem like it's worth a try because you would really like for some reparation to be there, uh, your sister's going to have to take care of more of the issues that she has before that would ever be possible. So, but yeah, it's just something for you to think about. And so maybe depending what you think about that, you just, it might be in your best interest not to ever make another offer just in case, you know, it's up to you, of course. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, thank you so much, AJ. Your videos and podcasts have helped immensely. You're a gem. Oh, thank you so much. That's very humbling. That's very nice. I super appreciate that. Thank you. And I just do my best, and it's my passion to help people. And uh, the best I can. And Jackie, why would a BPD person try to hide their symptoms from a favorite person or be hesitant to talk about their condition with a favorite person? Because I, well, the, again, <laughs> lots of variables could be many reasons could be shame, 
could be fear of abandonment. Could be that they already know, like maybe they've had more than one favorite person. They usually tend to have one at a time, not always, but maybe they know kind of what would happen. Maybe they're afraid that if they showed more of, you know, their difficulties, let's say more than quote who they really are unquote, because they don't know who they are, then they're hesitant to really talk about their condition or, or they might be hiding as much of their symptoms as they can because they're afraid of abandonment and they have, it's the rejection sensitivity again. And being the favorite person of somebody with BPD is not an enviable, enviable place to be. It is not a healthy place to be. Hey there, Wheels. Long time no see. How you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. I'm doing well. How are you? And Sayan, sorry if I'm not saying that correctly. Another question. How common is twin flame talk? Oh, very common. And as common as it is in certain circles, you know, on YouTube and elsewhere on the internet, it's equally as cuckoo, cuckoo. In my humble opinion, it's out there. You know, it's just not grounded. But other people and other mental health professionals, they believe in it. I don't get why. It seems all too ridiculous to me. And believe in astrology, psychic stuff, being clairvoyant. I know. It's incredible, isn't it? Saying universe is in alignment for me. Oh, yeah, because that really shows the people with BPD, doesn't it? They can't get along with anybody, but the universe is somehow aligning for them. Yes, because, yeah. Oh, yes, and angel numbers. She started mentioning all of this. Well, the one thing I could tell you about that with assuredness is that a lot of people with BPD, go that route. They will seek out, uh, well, and, and more the, the you know, the, uh, sorry, the twin flame thing is usually more talked about by, uh, you know, somebody who's with a narcissist and that horrible, also equally horrible, terrible kind of like, it's never going to work, but let's keep fighting for it because it means we're even more meant to be together. Say what? That is some magical thinking. That is lack of critical thinking. So, um, but yeah, a lot of people with BPD, they will, they will spend money in best time in talking to somebody, you know, who's an astrologer or whatever, uh, talking to a psychic or an apparent psychic. I mean, I think there's some people out there are psychic, but I don't think they waste time with silly stuff. I don't know. Um, and then they'll think they're clairvoyant or that they're psychic. It's all magical thinking. And, um, that, yeah, when they believe the universe is in alignment with them, that's just, you know. And it's, it's all kind of like the magical thinking in BPD, but it extends beyond BPD, obviously. It's, um, it's just falsely equating everything together as if it fits together because it, they somehow think it's just, quote, a good thing, unquote. Oh, it's amazing. And they, they will spend time, effort, money on actually paying people who are doing this or wanting to do this themselves, thinking they have these talents or gifts, which probably not. And, and the other thing is, and, or they'll buy books and, you know, they'll watch all the videos blah, 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 on it, you know, and, um, they'll do everything and anything, but go to the pro appropriate treatment modality for them so that they could actually get some relief from all they're going through and all they're putting like what, what, what this person has put you through. Um, yeah, well, when, you know, it's, it's all, esoteric nonsense basically that's just my opinion other people have different opinions but i believe that maybe not absolutely everything but we have to we would have to really define narrowly i would to say this that all esoteric is woo woo but yeah when it's woo woo it's just not grounded you know it not a lot of facts there so very common for people with bpd by the way just so you know it's not just the person that's really devastated you and Jackie, how, how can they become a psychologist if they have BPD? And wouldn't the professionals they work with be able to see, to tell? Well, potentially. But, you know, when people are students in university and they're paying that money, they don't get up and do something outlandishly ridiculous in the class, even if they're really difficult for a professor. I mean, when I was in university, I was in therapy too. But I still wasn't recovered at that point. But I was before I started working in, in this area. But um, 
so there's nothing in that system that really, unless somebody keeps going and talking to a professor or goes to uh, a university psychologist or, you know, like counselor, uh, and, and and says a whole lot that might, you know, if it's, if it's severe enough, be brought to the attention of their, um, like where they're getting educated. Um, they're just, there aren't any checks and balances in the system that way. And I think too that, um, uh, what, what was I going to say about that as well? Um, yeah, often they're not going to act out, you know, in school or, you know, with their professors. Uh, the same, or even classmates, the same way they will in interpersonal relationships. And again, that speaks more to the high functioning borderline, which doesn't mean that they are less borderline. It just means that they are a little bit more defended than the average and they can do this functioning. But, but then again, when they're in the mental health profession or many other professions, you know, law, doctors, all of it matters that people are on their best, you know, functionality points, Right and doing their jobs professionally. Um, but they can, they definitely have the intellect to do it and probably the interest. And then the problem is when they get there, if they haven't had any more treatment, um, yikes. And, you know, I have lots of clients that have gone through the yikes and it's, that that's a real big problem. And I really don't know what to say about it other than that, but um, and, and let's face it, there's, I think there's a lot of psychiatrists in the power center of the American Psycholo or Psych Psychiatric Association. They're, they're close to be for sure. You know what I'm saying? Like more to the extreme end of it. And a question I've always had, it's rhetorical really, unless somebody actually has an answer, but why did Theodore Million so well-defined sadistic personality disorder but they won't put it in the DSM. Hmm. Could it be that the power center does like does does the reflection shine back too brightly? I don't know. Um, the things like that always make me ask questions. So, um, but yeah, people with BPD or a narcissist or whatever, they can go in and get a university education, uh, even if they're somewhat difficult or very difficult, and out they go. And you said, even said my deceased father came to her in a dream. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that because who needs to hear that, right? I mean, you, in your case, I mean, I don't mind hearing it from you. Um, in a dream from heaven and said he supports her. To say, oh, my God. Well, then you know she's out of her flipping mind, right? Like that is just inconsiderate, cruel, manipulative, and... She may have even had a psychotic break there. I'm just saying, you know, those transient paranoid things, which can be some transient psychosis in BPD. Could have been that. I don't know, because that makes absolutely no sense. And I'm sorry that you had to endure even hearing that. And she, I believe you that she believes it. Um, it's like I'm in another world when I'd hear her. Well, yeah, and please just know, ground yourself because she's not grounded, right? Wow, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, Jackie, thank you so much for your videos, by the way. They really helped me a lot. I'm glad. And I hope that something I've, you know, answered along the way here has been somewhat helpful. Um, and you're very welcome. And it just suddenly happened after the cheating stuff never before. Well, that's interesting because sometimes after they do something wrong, whether they're actually taking that in in a moment or like now or not, they can feel more shame. And perhaps some of this, like, and that can bring more distress, even though they carry on regardless, right, going forward. Um, and that can bring about more shame. It could bring more chaos and turmoil inside, but nothing that they'll actually address or know how to address. And so maybe she's seeking to soothe herself with all this nonsense. Because they'll often try to soothe themselves through all kinds of nonsense because they won't go to therapy to learn how to soothe themselves. Uh, I'm just being passionate, by the way. I'm not angry. Um, Jackie, when you break up with a BPD and they act cold and like they don't care, do they really not care or are they just making their pain, um, masking their pain from the breakup? Again, it could be either or. And so it's very different, again, for many people with BPD. 
so some could be masking their pain. Some could have immediate regret. Some could be remorseful, but they don't really understand why. And they're not going to change it if they were able to come back, right? Or undo what they just did or said or whatever. Um, and, and so some are really cold, really feel distant, really feel kind of like the unconscious experience there is they feel like they were abandoned again, even if they ghosted you. And they get emotionally dysregulated and they go cold because it's a very cold and distant, hard, no emotions anymore, which seems weird from a borderline, but they just turn it off because it's the maladaptive defensive coping mechanisms of the false self. And it is that sort of childlike out of sight, out of mind. And they just really don't care. Most of them. And then there are some that might be masking some pain because they do care, but they don't know what else to do, or they think you've somehow done something so unforgivable, which is not usually the case, um, that they have to, that, you know, it's a big push away and devaluation. So it can, it can be different in various people with BPD. So again, and the way people can maybe try to ascertain that with an X is by the kind of patterns that you might now retrospectively look back at and say, well, did they have a tendency to be cold and shut off their emotions if they were triggered, dysregulated, angry, or if that wasn't the case, you know, because usually people will be able to, might not realize in the moment, but later we'll go, well, yeah, like when this would happen and this, and they would always do this. And, and maybe that's not the case for everyone. So um wheels i'm doing all right i've been getting better since i got um housed yes well that was really super important i mean that was long overdue for you but i also recently found out how much fun it can be to have a narc use the legal system oh no um do some of them just never stop well unfortunately uh, yeah, they might run out of litigation processes and or people that will litigate. But then if they're paying well, there's always those, you know, unconscionable type lawyers out there or with no conscience. Um, the best thing you can do is, well, yeah, it can be hard to defend yourself if, if they're coming through the legal system. Best thing you can do, though, is just keep seeking to do that. And um without reacting to anything that you don't have to react to, but if you have to react to protect yourself, like legally speaking, um, hopefully they will eventually stop, but you know, they can go a long time before they'll ever stop. And I'm sorry to have to give you that bad news because, you know, you, I hope you know contact as much as you can be because, you know, remember when we talked about that on live streams prior, quite a while ago that, you know, when you get quote free from them, unquote, there would be the emotional work still to do to get freer. And then there would be, and I hope they wouldn't be like this, but yeah, knowing the narc in your life, I'm really sorry it's going this way for you. It, it, I think there comes a time when they do stop, but it takes quite a while. And unfortunately, Wheels, I think you're still early in that narc's game, unfortunately. Um, James, I feel sad sometimes because I was the one that left a lot um, because of her rage. I lived with her. I had to leave. Her fun was discarded. She said I broke up too many times. She never took accountability. Well, yeah, and that could leave you with, you know, maybe ruminating about or kind of falsely believing that, you know, if you hadn't have left, well, then you'd still be with her today. But then it can what was that experience really like, even though there was probably the good side, right? And you did the right thing for yourself. And then, you know, she's just blaming you in the end, right? Because like you said, she's taking no accountability. So you need to remember all that she's accountable for and responsible for, and that she left you. You still had a choice. You made your choice. But it basically, she left you without a choice, though you did make a choice. And remember that because good choice for you. So, um, yeah, it's like you had to leave. So I hope that you just keep reaffirming that and validating yourself with that so that you don't second guess yourself. Because that's the way in which a borderline not only blames and obfuscates any responsibility or accountability, but, yeah, they they too can gaslight like that. 
And you, you need to make sure that what they put down with that, you don't pick up. And it's hard because usually people will feel guilty for some period of time, will feel bad about it, but I hope that you're moving through or maybe you're past that now. Um, Jackie, do BPDs really care about a friend or family member like they are adamant they do? Um, again, variables. Some people BPD can be have a sense of caring more but may not demonstrate it a lot, may still lack. They have empathy, but may not show you a lot of empathy if they're triggered, dysregulated, etc. cetera. Um, I think that it's more people, especially untreated with BPD than not, they say they care a lot, but what they care most about is what you can do for them and what they need from you. To be perfectly honest about it, and whether they're conscious of that or not is another story. But that's kind of how it stacks up. You know what I mean? That's kind of how it's experienced. That's kind of what's really motivating it. Unconsciously, again, they might not be consciously aware of that. And then you said, if so, how can they just distance themselves from you? Well, again, you know, they have a lot of maladaptive defensive coping mechanisms that are repetition compulsion, unconscious, really, you know, habituated patterns of behavior that don't make any sense in the here and now, but might make sense to what they went through as a child. But then, you know, when they become adults, they have to go and get some treatment or like, you know, nothing works out. So often when they're so adamant that they really care about a friend or a family member, they don't really care as much as they think they do. And they might have the intention to care, but they're really so caught up in their own dilemmas and struggles and feelings and not knowing why they're feeling the way they are and who. So they think that this person, that person just did this, that, the other to them. And they re experience, you know, that real helpless place they might have been in in childhood over and over again in the here and now, dissociatively, because it doesn't belong in the here and now. Because in the here and now, they need to go get treatment and learn how to take responsibility for themselves. But the bottom line to the, to the answer what you said there asked is that if if they really were at meaning as much how much they care as adamant as they are about you, then it could still be easy for them to distance for you from you for other reasons, all those defense mechanisms, patterns, the way they will experience you as object, other parent representative, uh, representation, um, in devaluation, bad parent, wounding parent, and aside from that. It can just be straight up because they really don't care about people as much as they do because they're so busy with themselves and with what they're going through, et cetera. Um, Owen. Um, oh, hey there. Um, well, thank you so much for that, Owen. Uh, appreciate it. And um, nice to see you here. Um, some people might say they love me and other people it's the opposite. But hey, what are you going to do? It's not all about dichotomies, but I'm a lightning rod. It just is the way it is. I accepted that a long time ago. Because now I'm saying borderlines are not capable. What did I just do? Holy crap. I hope I didn't interrupt anything because um, my screen just jumped out at me. Okay, there we go. Way too big. Um, Because <clears throat> I'm here. I mean, I didn't really get a lot to say a lot about it because people came and wanted to ask questions. And But I'm talking about it a lot in videos. Borderlines, I'm saying it a little more boldly here, are not capable of healthy relationships, period. And now, um, changing what I've said before, which still may apply to some people with BPD, unless and until significantly treated, which is like, what does that mean? Well, the bottom line is I'm here today to be even bolder and say, until they're healed or recovered, they're not capable of healthy relationships. They are not relationship material. Now I've lost my place because I blew the comments up again because they blew up too much and now you had to readjust. So I think, um, uh, what comment am I on right now? Um, yes, there was a comment there. I don't know where it went, but yes, I was dealing with it. Too. Oh yes, Owen's comment that I'm a lightning rod because I'll say things like this, what I'm saying more boldly now, and I'll say they need to be healed or recovered. So in other words, no borderline should you be in a relationship with. But when I say that, 
it hits the next dilemma, as I said earlier, because so many people think that people with BPD can't heal and recover. Oh, yeah, they can. But so many won't ever try. And so many might try, but not go the distance. And then there's other variables to that process. But, and I won't, I won't go on a tangent here because I've been here too long already, but um, what the American Psychiatric Association says about why people with BP can't recover, but, oh, they can get to remission, don't you know? Um, I think I've talked about in videos before. If anybody's interested, you could always leave a comment into the live stream if you want me to talk about it again. But BPD does not need to be cured. BPD needs to be healed from and recovered from. Because no matter how it's described and the more and more they pathologize it, um, psychiatry is not interested in, quote, curing, unquote, BPD. It doesn't need a psychiatric cure. And the meds are useless, okay? So, but but that's controversial for me to say because I know a lot of people don't, like I see it all over the internet, you know, oh yeah, I like your information. I watch her videos. Yeah, she's helped me a lot, but I don't think she's recovered from BBD because you can't do that. So just saying. <laughs> Lightning rod me. Um, and Jackie asks, is it helpful for the non-BPD person to go back through old messages from the BPD to try to piece together what happened, or is that just keeping the non-BPD person stuck? Yeah, it will keep you more stuck than it will prove helpful. And it's all hindsight, and it it really will cut into your wellness to focus more on the X than yourself and moving forward. And, you know, I would say if you have any questions, you know, feel free to leave a, a comment under this, this um, live stream, or you can go to my website, which is in every description box of every video, audio, podcast, whatever, and you can contact me and you can just let me know. Uh, what else would you like me to talk about specifically, right? So I can do it in a video and, and why it might, you know, I could maybe address why that, you know, more, more broadly, but more in depth, why that would be unhelpful. But yeah, I, I, I don't think that if you go back that you'll actually have that moment of piecing it together as clearly as you might understand something more by just continually moving forward. And you asked, is it helpful for healing? Uh, or did I just hit the same comment? No, I think you put that up there twice. Okay, got that one. Um, James, her family told me that she was diagnosed as bipolar as a teen. After your videos, I'm positive she's BPD. Is that a common misdiagnosis? Definitely can be. And I think um, it, it definitely is. And it certainly could be in an adolescent. When if they don't know what they're diagnosed, I don't know what's going on with this BPD bipolar mix up of psychiatry largely, because frankly, maybe they are that unintelligent. I don't know. But to me, it's like they don't take the time anymore to properly assess and they probably don't really listen and they're really speedy with the prescription pad, right? Because I don't really understand how they can't tell the difference. I mean, Sometimes you might have to work with somebody longer, assess longer, uh, revisit it. Uh, some people do have BPD and bipolar. Uh, but so the bottom line would be all this misdiagnosis, it's rampant and it's kind of inexcusable and they should know how to do a better job. But I could see where in her teen years she might have got bipolar because they're so reticent against generally speaking, psychiatry and, and whatever, to diagnose people in their adolescence as having BPD, which actually a lot, like, um, I don't know how to say his name, but a couple of psychiatrists work that I really, I, I respect some psychiatrists work, right? Just not most of them. And I don't know the rest of them, you know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, the, in, in um, the Boston area, har around Harvard, Massachusetts, somewhere in there, I don't know. There's a whole entire adolescent um, treatment program, and they do diagnose in adolescents, but they they specialize in that. So that's still not going wide enough and broad enough and to enough places, and I, I don't know. It might be in other areas. But I think that, you know, we should know enough by now 
or psychiatry, let me say, should know enough by now that um, you can kind of tell the difference if you really pay attention between a 14 or 15 year old with BPD patterns versus a 14 year or 15 year old who's just doing some adolescent acting out. So, um, but she probably got that misdiagnosis in particular in her teen years because they wouldn't diagnose BPD. And I hear you, you know, everything you've ever said in your comments or on live streams certainly sounds like the patterns of BPD. And I guess the only other question would be, could she have both or did they just screw that up? Because they're making that mistake a lot, both ways, by the way, they're diagnosing people that don't have BPD with BPD because they have bipolar and they're diagnosing people that don't have bipolar, but have BPD with bipolar. I don't get it. And, um, in her email, um, sorry, in her emailing me for money for our son, an attempt at hoovering. Oh, is it? Um, well, it depends on how, like you would know more than me, right? It depends on how justified was that money. How much did your son need whatever she was talking about or not? That would be the best way to gauge if it was really what was needed or an attempt at hoovering because, you know, truthfully, it could have been a bit of both. It's really hard to say. Oh, but then you said he doesn't need money and is fine. Well, then, yeah, attempt at hoovering. Um, and you said, I'm 100% certain of this. Well, then, yeah, in that light, it really seems like then it becomes an attempt at hoovering. She went from calling me a narcissist before to emailing me. Yeah, that's that's not good. That's not comfortable. But you have a child, so the best you can do is ignore most of what she says. If she's emailing you and saying anything else, just just try to give her really short responses or answers if, in fact, you have to respond. So, like, if she mentions your son, maybe you have to respond. But really short and to the point about, what does he need? What, 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 you know, and, and just keep sort of trying to not respond. I mean, she did that there and you knew basically, and I think, you know, now it was a hoovering, but other than whatever you dealt with about your son, just, just try not to be spending too much time in contact with her. Cause you want to be as low contact as possible. And by the way, uh, she went from calling you. Oh yeah. A narcissist. Okay to emailing you. So I don't know, has, has she been phoning you before calling you? Because really, you know, I don't know if texting is the best or email. Email might be the best. But um, yeah, you definitely don't want her phoning you all the time. So, But it's hard when you have a child. So you just need to keep on trying to be really detached from what she says, other than if it's truly about your son. And what you do have to discuss about your son or sharing custody, right? You need to really kind of like let everything else she says go in one ear and out the other with the hope that maybe one day she'll do less of it. That's a really tough spot to be in, though. Um, oh, that, well, yeah, saying sorry to bother you. No, she wasn't sorry to bother you. It sounds like it was a Hoover. Then proceeds to ask, um, and was so nice, um, a huge change of tone after I um, filed. Interesting. Yes. Uh, you can't trust that as far as you could throw that. Right. So yeah, from what you're telling me, it sure seems like she was hoovering you. And by saying that she needed money for something for your son that, you know, she, she didn't need. Um, Aaron words. What a cool name. You said, uh, oh, yeah, okay, that's a hi. I thought it was a hoy, but it's actually, yes, those typos. Um, you said, been a while since I've been here. Well, welcome back. Are you um, saying only those who have untreated BPD are incapable of healthy relationships, or all people with BPD are incapable of healthy relationships? Well, I'm basically saying all people, but I guess a caveat to that would be there are some individuals, right? There are individual things. There are people that have had a certain amount of therapy, which needs to be really significant long-term, not a year, not three months, not a year and a half, who might really be grasping change because people can heal and recover from BPD. But I still don't advise people to hang around in relationships that are otherwise chaotic and hurtful and painful while they're going to therapy. But yeah, I'm saying pretty much all. And I think that 
what I'm, but, but I'm not, okay. So I don't want to be as black and white as that because the reason for stepping up and being a bit bolder with the statement isn't really to say a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Right. But unless they've got to this place that is almost healed or recovered, seriously, that much therapy and that much success in changing and growing and maturing and finding out who they are, et cetera, which helps them learn how to communicate changes all of the behaviors that are so unwanted and so damaging to them and others and relationships. So I think that most of them, unless they are at that threshold, which is close to recovery of having really been successfully treated, but perhaps not entirely recovered yet, then there will be those, there will be a certain percentage of people with BPD in that category. And the reason for me making a more bold statement isn't to ignore that fact, but is to more drive home the point I'm trying to make here generally, broadly for people who are holding out such false hope, right? So it's like, I'm not saying never, 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 but I'm saying, wow, is that a high bar, right? And that more people than not and specifically untreated, absolutely not. And, but it's not so easy. Like people will be in the relationship and then find this out later. And then it's not like you can just go, oh, well, yeah. And, you know, they can't have healthy relationships. I'm out of here. Because no, it's very difficult. So I'm trying to make a really bold statement. But yeah, there's a caveat to it. But it's bolder and more, trying to have more clarity for the majority of people. Because it will be in a minority of people with BPD who have been very successfully treated to date over a longer significant period of time and will be successfully enacting that in their life, which may change the relationship picture. It will be significantly far less people than all the people that people out there are with codependency hanging on a false hope, trying to do the revolving door thing, doing the recycling thing, so I'm just trying to make a bold statement to get people's attention to how the highest percentage of people with BPD untreated and or if they really haven't had success in their therapy or haven't been at it very long. So yeah, there's always going to be that other group of people, which I don't know what the percentages are, that might be different. And that's what each person individually should know, Right. And at, to some degree or other, and I've had clients where, you know, they'll come along and, and they'll explain where they're at and where the person with BPD and how much therapy and what's changing and why are they talking to me now? Because it's not the general usual. Um, this is impossible, but I want him or her back. And so, yeah, don't, don't take me totally black and white on that. Just trying to step up the seriousness of the statement to cover the majority of people. So I hope that that explained that. And thank you for asking the question because I think really I would have been remiss if I didn't make that a little bit more clear. Um, Jackie, I think it has been helpful for me to go back through old messages to understand the BPDX better. There were hidden messages that I didn't know back then that I understand now I get triggered though. Well, and again, perhaps when I answered your question earlier, I should have said, put a caveat in there again that, you know, everybody's not the same and it depends. Okay. So you found that that's helpful and that's positive, but you've also found that it's triggering. So I guess, you know, you have to weigh the balance there and then you have to ask yourself, when is it enough? Right. So if it's worked for you and you have been able to understand things better by looking back, then how much more do you think you really need to know to just move forward? So that, that's something you have to think about and, and try to find a balance with because you don't want to be getting triggered too often and you want to be able to continually keep moving forward. And Owen, um, what I learned from you, <coughs> excuse me, is how empathy, what they're saying is, I wasn't able to see that before. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Hmm. That's interesting because I probably said something like that somewhere in the video here or there. But I guess what you're saying is um, 
Oh, oh, I okay, I misread it. That's why I'm confused. So you said, let me start over. I apologize. This text is too small. Uh, what I learned from you is how empty what they're saying is. Now that makes sense. I'm like, empathy, what? Wait, okay, sorry for my error. I wasn't able to see that before. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yes, definitely. Because they really are in their own right, people with BPD, just like narcissists even more so, and somewhat similarly, but not exactly the same, they're empty vessels. And it's sad and it's tragic because if they would just seek help and stick with it and really be dedicated to that, and that's hard, it's daunting, it's no joke, it hurts like hell, but it's still more rewarding than it could ever be painful if people stick with it and are determined and people need to go to BPD treatment for themselves only, not to save a relationship, not to make this better or that better, and not to undo this or change that. But the bottom line is, yeah, they are really empty because they are people living without a known self. And I'm glad that that was helpful for you because yes, like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And that can be painful in a process, but that sounds like maybe it helped you moving forward. Oh, you said, I'm still unclear on what it means that they don't have a self, but I get a general sense of it. Yeah, and I don't know if I have videos on that in particular or not, because, you know, sometimes I'll talk about things in videos, but it's not the exact title of the video. So, again, maybe I'll have to think about maybe doing a video in <clears throat> excuse me, entitled that. I just better get another drink here before my throat caves in. Um, One second. Did I say I need to get another video? Oh, man, if I did. Whoa. I meant a drink, obviously, and it's water. I think I said another video. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Holy crap, where'd that come from? Because I'm thinking about a video I need to make. Okay. I'm not losing my mind yet. I'm almost 65. It's all good. And that's me just joking around because stuff like that's happened since I was young too, right? We all do it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, well, this lack of self, right, here's the thing. Maybe I will do a video on it, 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 you know, exclusively, even though I've talked about it a lot in other videos with that title. So I'll just say quickly here that the arrested emotions about, this is, by the way, the object relations theory, which has been tried and true and tested and studied and, and replicated in studies. It's an older modality. It's an older, me older methodology for understanding and explaining, but it is the best bar none. Explaining cluster B in general, people with BPD specifically. And so this lack of self, the mother of object relations, basically Melanie Klein, said that when the abandonment occurs or the lack of attunement what is a threat to the biological survival of the infant and or young toddler. So when that happens, it creates, it causes, as Melanie Klein said, here's a direct quote part, the psychological death of the otherwise burgeoning authentic self, unquote. Therefore, what we have in that and more established more deeply, but just within that quote even, and of course where that comes from and what was studied, we have the words that describe that the psychological self evacuates. It just fragments off. And I've described that as just using Eric Burns, parent, adult, child, because I don't really care for all the, you know, crazy speak of id, ego, super ego, Freud stuff. Um, so the parent, adult, child, the three ego states, the child state of ego upon this, you know, the, the, the things that cause this to happen and the adverse experience, et cetera, and the lack of attunement and sometimes more than that happens before by the age of two, often way before the age of two. And then, so what happens is that psychological self, the child, that the, the ego state of child that would be forming fragments off. And that means the rest of the emotional development. And they stay emotionally stuck in, in infancy to early toddlerhood to, you know, before the age of two. 
And in um, early childhood development, generally speaking, when people get through the next stage of development during the second year of life, like after year two, going on towards age of three, which is after the arrest, when people are, are diagnosed with BPD, then uh, what that means is they don't go through any more of those stages of like emotional growing or, or uh, you know, that's why they don't have object constancy either because like your average two-year-old, you know, going from the age of two into the age of three is going to learn like mom's around the corner when mom's coming back. Uh, Peekaboo is a good game, right? And people with some resiliency and enough nurture and parenting and not all the other adverse experience, well, they have a developing self that continues to develop. And in this stage, what I'm trying to say is that people with BPD arrest before they could get to the separation individuation phase of development, which is really crucial because this is why they have no, well, and they lose the self. So they have no idea of the difference between self and other because what's self? And I lived through loss of self and arrested emotional development. So I, I didn't know at the time. But when I think back to what was that like, it's really hard to put that in words because you don't know what it is. You don't know what's happening to you, even when you get older, um, like when you're like 12, 14, whatever. <laughs> but I think that, so this lack of self means that there is no container of self. There is not the entity there of the person that would otherwise be there. So the false self rises up and that's what's there is this protective false self. And that's where you see all the defenses and it's sort of protecting that evacuated self. But the thing is, as much as that might sound daunting or strange and or confusing, so just as I, I could elaborate on that or, or certainly object relations uh, elaborates on that a whole lot more, it is through that lens of seeing what really causes this, whether there's any genetics involved or not, because they don't know or they can't prove it, it doesn't really matter. Then it also becomes the pathway of understanding for how to help somebody to find itself to slowly, and there's many different methodologies, but DBT skills isn't one of them, to slowly bring down the defenses in a process to be able to realize and then having the therapist holding this, trying to form a container of self, gets held between the therapist and the client. And then when, when that client with BPD is able to trust you enough, and that takes a lot of work, they can then start to let defenses come down. They're feeling much more pain. Then we have to do a lot of work around helping them to cope with that pain, how to feel that pain, how to ground, how to know it's not going to mean the end of them because they have the anxiety of the death instinct already from what happened in the loss of self. And so then this container is built in the process between the therapist and the client. And then slowly and over, it takes a long time. The um, client will start to interject that, will start to take that in, will start to experience that still through the therapist in um, kind of like a I don't know, is that that would be like, not really transference, no. But the thing is, so they will start to experience it that way. And then it's building that sense of self inside that person. And then after all that primary, like primal core work is done, which takes a long time in processes with people with BPD, if you can get them there, if they can break, if they can endure the pain, learn the coping mechanisms, et cetera, then after that, it looks more like a process of reparenting that wounded child that is now sort of known as a really young self. So maybe I'll talk more in detail about it, um, like in a hopefully not too long way, in a video to just try to make that more palpably understandable to people. And the other reason why it's probably very confusing is because not a lot of other people are talking about it. They're on to this newfangled thing and that newfangled thing. And some of those things have applicability. But psychiatry and the APA is pretty much on to pathologizing, you know, pretending to have uh, studies that are scientific, that are pseudoscience. And they're saying things like, well, people with BPD have secondary psychopathy. No, they don't. And, and um, BP is not the female, female variant of antisocial personality whatsoever at all. 
But this is the crap speak. It's the crap speak. And it confuses a lot of people. And I'm not saying, well, I know way more than they know. No, what I'm saying is they clearly have not proven a thing because the studies are never replicated. Some in other areas of the world, not studying that in particular, but they replicate their studies. But not in the American Psychiatric Association, which affects more than America, like it subsumed Canada and, and some other countries, Western countries, and other countries that don't have really the structure of mental health. So they adapt to the DSM-5 TR, which is in some ways a little helpful, but essentially a load of crap. And they keep pathologizing BPD and pathology. So what's getting lost is the actual explanation that was studied that makes sense, that is the best lens to understand this through. And, and not only my opinion, but many other professionals' opinions. And Dr. James F. Masterson, unfortunately he's passed now, but he did a lot of work as an institute. I believe it's somewhere in New York State. Uh, it could be in New York City. I don't know. But an institute of object relations, et cetera, there are a lot of people that adhere to this methodology and practice it. And I'm somebody who does that as well. But I also use eclectic methodology and other things as well. But there's nothing that explains it better. And that's why you're not going to read a lot or hear a lot about it out there because People simply aren't, they don't have that depth of understanding or don't want to talk about it or don't care about it. I, I think it's really essential. And um, Ravel to Expand. Oh, I love that name. I just really like the paradox of some people's names. That's really great. Uh, just a second here. Um, uh, okay. Because some of these names on YouTube, you know, I'm trying to take your handle away, but I can definitely use them in analogies of, you know, trying to illustrate paradoxical things. You, but you said, do you think the horrible acting in most, um, oh, the horrible acting, acting in usually sounds different for me. Acting in most movies nowadays is affecting people's personalities. There's no way people act like they do in Netflix movies in real life. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure which movies you're referencing because I would say, well, quote entertainment movies versus documentaries, right? Obviously, like I haven't watched it yet because I really loathe to, but I probably will. Um, the Dahmer, the movie on Dahmer on Netflix. Um, so that would be an example of something that actually happened, right? But I don't know if it's just horrible acting in most movies nowadays, as much as it is repetitive, inculcating, so BS to start with, agended scripting. Because I don't know how they're supposed to act that out better, because the scripting's got to be getting worse. I don't watch, like, I'm really picky about movies, so I don't, and I find most movies are now, their, their real meaning is not entertainment, it's predictive programming. It's inculcation. And so there's a there's a lot of movies I just won't bother watching. Not that I think they're going to inculcate me because I think I'm quite awake, thank you. But not a wokest. I'm just awake. Um, but yes, I think that a lot of things about the internet, a lot of things about all of the, the platforms on the internet, not just YouTube or whatever social media, I think that lamestream media and what's really going on there, because they're not telling anybody the truth, um, is... And, and what's happening in movies, being predictive, being inculcating. It's like what Chomsky talked about, manufacturing consent. It is um, gaslighting on a mass, massive scale in our world um, by elitists that are basically malignant narcissists, psychopaths, and dark triads. So that's on the macrocosm level. So I don't think it's just the bad acting. I think it's the scripts and the fact that I mean, I don't know what you're referring to, but there, there can be some horror. I know there can be some horrible acting because like, I don't know about other people, but I can't watch another boy meet gets girl story. doesn't even matter that I'm not heterosexual, but like, seriously, I don't want to watch a lesbian movie about girl gets girl either. It's like, ah, and the codependency laden um, scripting in these movies. Like, like what was that? Jerry Maguire. There's so many others, but like, uh, you had me at hello. You complete me. Gag me with a spoon. The thing is, no, I said to gag me with a spoon. That wasn't in the line. But the thing is, they are also right now the Mandela effect. 
they are changing lines in movies and they are rewriting textbooks of history. And this is all horrific stuff. So yes, the answer to your question, I probably added a little bit more to than you asked, or maybe than you wanted to know, or that you are uh, even um, feel the same way or think the same way as I do about is that everything is really affecting people's personalities today. But that doesn't mean that's really the causation of personality disorders. And let me just say that I also really believe that if anybody studies this and you really apply yourself to it, that, you know, thinking back to Dr. Tom Azaz, and even though he's a psychiatrist, the humanistic psychology movement, uh, he said that mental illness is a false construct. And he said, uh, well, I don't know if he said this specifically, but I would say personality disorders are also a false construct. Now, what is that? It doesn't mean that there's not that happening for people, but the construct in which it's put in, where the APA continues to study, 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 what are they really doing? Well, they're not replicating anything. They're not proving anything. They're, I guess, pushing money in circles. <laughs> and they're trying to, with the hegemony of big pharma, make sure that most of the masses are on some kind of medication, right? That wouldn't be a gender size at all, would it? Gee, I don't know. I can't go any further on YouTube. But the bottom line is it's affecting people's mental health for sure. Whether we look at that as a personality issue, stress, anxiety, depression, the whole enchilada really, I mean, it's just affecting people's mental health. And when you said there's no way that people act like they do in Netflix movies in real life, that kind of speaks to all entertainment from, I mean, I'm older, but I'm not like that ancient. I don't know when, you know, the advent of TV. Yeah, that came along a long before I was born. But like, um, they've had a lot of sort of the old archaic technologies before they ever introduced them to consumers and to the world. Same with the internet. The internet comes out of the, you know, industrial military complex of America. So yeah, we get to use it for what we want to. It can be helpful sometimes, but it's more damaging than not. And, you know, it's just sort of like, okay, so Leave it to Beaver was before my time. Let me just make that clear. If, if anyone gets the TV reference or My Three Sons or um, even like The Brady Bunch, that wasn't before my time, but The Brady Bunch, Partridge Family, those kind of, you know, situation comedy, family shows that you don't see made anymore, they were all about, you know, codependency, uh, they weren't most people's real life, right? Like, I remember watching something like the Brady Bunch. Okay, so what was that? I don't know, late 60s, early 70s. And I'm like, uh, just about to hit adolescence somewhere in there. And I'm like, watching this TV show because it was something I so needed in my life. I'm like, can that be real? Because I thought, well, if the Brady Bunch parents could really care about the kids. Maybe that happens out there somewhere. Cause I had, you know, so I think that so much of television, so much of movies, it's really never been mirroring back to us a whole lot of real life and it's getting worse and worse. And like I said, inculcation, brainwash, all kinds of techniques being used. This is not conspiracy theory. This is stuff that's been researched and it's known. And I did just recently about a, well, I don't know, four or five days ago, I think I purchased it in 2015, but I just watched a documentary, Noam Chomsky's uh, Manufacturing Consent. Consent. There's another book now I have to go pay 190 bucks for because I have to read it because it's like from the 1950s and it references so much that's going on today. And it's not, it's not, it's, I forget what it's called, but it's not Brave New World and it's not um, the other one because it was written in the four, 1940 something. But the, um, well, I can't believe I can't remember the title. But so there's much more to the psychology of what they've been doing to us as a society. We've been going on for a lot longer than it just seems to have crept up on us. And so many lies and so many things that, oh, apparently this happened this way. No, it might have happened, but maybe it happened for that reason. And maybe when this genocide or that genocide happened, it happened because no, it wasn't really these people over here. It was, it was America behind that over there, which I just, it was, it was something in the Noam Chomsky's manufacturing consent documentary about Timor or East Timor. 
mind-boggling stuff I never even heard of in my life, never learned in school. So yes, and, and, and there's a lot about everything in this world today that if we're not resilient and if not, we're not working on our coping skills and we have resiliency, then that's why there's more anxiety disorders than ever. That's why there's more depression than, than ever and other things as well. Because, you know, even with the Panduli thing and the next iteration of said, and what is that about? I don't know, but like, I'm not playing that game. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. Bottom line is, it's all very troubling. And, you know, look at when we went into having to stay in our houses and then when we could could go out again, what, did you, what were they up to? What's the purpose? Well, it's it's more than meets the eye, I would say. So, yeah, I'm sorry if that was way more than you bargained for. <laughs> um, oh, they all seem psychopathic. Well, you know, that's interesting because a lot of those characters they are definitely, especially in, I don't even know what it's called anymore. It used to be science fiction. It's something else now. Um, so like movies like The Matrix, that's old, right? And and whatever's come along since, because I don't watch those kind of movies. They're clearly just inculcation tools of agenda-sized information uh, that pe they want people to take in and believe to stay in lockstep. And so, yeah, it makes sense to me that when you say they all seem psychopathic, I'm sure they're putting in a lot more characters like that. Why would that be? Because we're essentially being living in a world that in the macrocosm is being controlled in some manner or fashion or others or various ones by the extreme end of the cluster B spectrum, which, by the way, they don't include dark tetrad, dark triad, if there's a difference. Some say there are, some say there isn't. Um, they don't include that in the DSM either. I wonder why, you know? So, yeah, I, I, I fully well believe what you're saying. As somebody who doesn't watch many movies, I'd much rather read a book or watch a documentary, learn something that hopefully I can discern some reality about or not um, versus, like, quote, entertainment. I mean, I, I find sports entertaining. I find the odd other thing entertaining, but not really movies anymore. And music is I – like, I like lots of music. But you have to know when you're listening to an inculcating codependent song or 20 or 30 or 5,000. I'm not saying that that has any agenda. That's just people singing about their codependent reality, right? That heartbreak love story. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. Even though I haven't seen all the movies, they probably do have more psychopathic characters. And then with all the confusion around that as the APA seeks to muddy the waters about what is psychopathy, and I finally looked something up the other day. I'm like, what is with this sociopathy? What does this even mean? I'm so sick and tired of it. And to, to the vast degree now, more so than maybe before, sociopathy is interchangeable with psychopathy. So we're talking about any social personality disorder. We're not talking about BPD or even NPD with sociopathy. But we see people talking all the time, referencing borderline personality disorder, and they're all a bunch of sociopaths. No, they're not. No, they're not. And what is, sociop what is a sociopath really? What did it mean in the beginning? The term coined by some dude in about 1939 or something? It was speaking about asocial behavior, not antisocial, because people can be antisocial and not be psychopathic or sociopathic, but it was talking about asocial behavior. Like people, like with BPD, for example, the, the old definition, not now, they're not sociopaths was people just can't behave according to the norms of culture, right? Expected adult behavior. So that might mean they have a tantrum, they do a whole bunch of stuff, but it doesn't mean they're being aggressive toward people or physical with people. And so that was what it meant in the beginning. That's not what it means today. It's rather really muddied water. But the bottom line is, yeah, there's more and more characters like that in movies. And and again, I, I haven't watched many recently. I've probably watched a few over that are older um, recently and, and a lot of documentaries. But I would say it reminds me of, oh, shoot, am I going to forget? Um, oh, there was a movie. I can't remember now. Um, but, you know, actually they're making a lot more documentaries. But yeah, anyways, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but I, I hear you and I believe you. And, and when you put it that way, I, yeah, I totally agree with you. 
And um, Jackie, when BPDs give you compliments and make attempts to get close to you, is it to groom you so they can get what they want from you, or is it genuine? Well, again, <clears throat> not always clear cut, but for people, the 60% that aren't in any way sort of like narcissistic trait, comorbidity, whatever that means, um, people with BPD are not grooming you. People with BPD are just doing the freaking best they can, which is not really that great for them or other people. And they magically think and they ch in childlike ways unbeknownst to them and others often are just seeking to try to connect somehow because they really aren't good at that and they really don't know how to do that and they really don't trust that. It really, I think there is still a difference between what borderlines are doing and the narcissistic grooming of narcissists because that is a much more, and not all narcissists know they're doing that either because there's a, there's a spectrum there, but a lot of narcissists absolutely in a transactional way know exactly what they're doing with the grooming and the love bombing. And, you know, they kind of plan it out. They're much more aware because they're much more calculating because they're much more defended. And most people with BPD are too busy with roller coaster emotions and temper tantrums. And well, we can see narcissist rage, but they're on that emotional roller coaster in a way, even though sometimes it's not as obvious, it's not all the same, but much more so, like narcissists are not on that emotional roller coaster. And the odd time the covert, fragile, vulnerable narcissist will hit a similarly looking roller coaster. But, and by the way, there's no such thing as a covert borderline. And uh, somebody's trying to agendicize that because they want to make borderlines in a narcissist, you know, back then, and that's kind of what he does. So again, anyway, uh, what are the long-term effects for the non-BPD to keep having intrusive thoughts about the BPDX over a long period of time? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, the, the first obvious one is you have a lack of enjoying your life. You have a lack of peace at times with that, but it causes stress and it would likely be releasing, you know, cortisol into your blood a little bit more than if you weren't. Uh, having those intrusive thoughts and not that I want to try to over alarm people, but the more that those keep coming and going, it's really important to keep working on being able to get up from under them. And the way to do that is again, people usually might require some therapy to really make the connections to what is the original source of that, because it isn't the borderline or the narcissist in adulthood. So the thing with that is it can really affect your mental health over time. Uh, but it can stress your body, it can stress you, you know, physiologically. It's just not healthy for people. And it takes away from your enjoying your life. So, and for some people, there may be some health effects, and for other people, maybe not as much. So, it would be really important if you are having intrusive thoughts to keep working at means and methods to have that be as short as possible. And also to work on making sure that you're not stressed when that's happening. So how can you bring your stress level down if it goes up with the intrusive thoughts? It's like, again, it would be in a, a detaching from what you're actually thinking about. But that can still really impede upon the body because of the tracks that can be in the body still. So it can activate the HPA axis. It can activate your body and your amygdala. And you don't even have to feel charged up, and that can happen. So people really need to get to the source of those because they really shouldn't be ongoing throughout, you know, years and years after. Um, hey, Arnold, um, do most people with BPD have two parents with NPD or one parent with NPD and the other with BPD? It seems like the most popular upbringing for them is one narc father and a BPD mother. Well, it could just as easily be a narc mother and a BPD father, but um, most people with BPD, it's hard to say. Um, often they will have a BPD mother, might have a narc mother, might have had, like I had both. I mean, lots of people have both, right? Both parents are cluster Bs. But I don't think it's always the case. Um, but in terms of the 87%, diagnosed with BPD? Probably. I mean, not necessarily both, but one, more likely than not, 
but then maybe not always, but certainly parents that one might be severely codependent, one might be cluster B, and the severely codependent one won't protect the child from the cluster B parent, and children aren't seen and heard or paid attention to because a severely codependent parent with a borderline or a narcissist, like if they're not a borderline or narcissist themselves, well, a severely codependent parent is going to always be jumping to the tune of the cluster B spouse because they don't want to be the next target. So it's hard to say, but it's very common, I think. I mean, it was my experience too. Two cluster B parents or a cluster B parent. And often this is the case, so it doesn't always cause or create BPD for people if they're more resilient temperament. And depending on birth order, which can, you know, like the, the number of times a woman has had a child, she might become more accustomed to that, might, might be less happening in the womb to stress out a child in, in utero. Bottom line is, um, you know, some people that's the combo of parents or one codependent, one cluster B parent that leads a lot of people to having codependency. So it doesn't automatically necessarily always lead to somebody being BPD or NPD or having BPD or NPD can lead to codependency as well. Hey there, Talon. How are you? Nice to see you. Uh, MW, please do talk about, in a future video, about the self contained between the therapist and patient and then reparenting the young self. It sounds absolutely fascinating. Did you discover this method? Oh, heck no, I didn't discover it. No, I'm not a pioneering anything. I mean, I think I have ways of describing things, explaining things, perhaps working with clients. I know kind of what to pull out of what bag at what time or how to say things or how to approach things. But no, I, di I didn't um, discover the method. The methodologies are all there. It's it's more in not only that I do have a university education that I don't advertise, I don't care, you know, like, but people keep saying she does not or she tell you what it is. No, I won't tell you what it is. I, I don't care. Not where I'm leading from. But I mean, I've read because I love reading and I love this area I'm passionate about, right? So lived experience is one thing. Education is another which isn't all that really, if you don't have lived experience working in this area and, or you don't want to put a lot of time into reading a lot of clinical books, which I have done. So, you know, I don't get my information from Sam freaking Backnan. No, thank you. Because, you know, whatever he's claiming to be today or lately, yeah, right. Sure. Whatever. And his perspective is skewed. I'm not saying he isn't a genius and, you know, he has some good things to say, but he goes askew all the time. And it's like, it drives me nuts. and nothing I can do about it. But the button, and, and so then his protege, Granin, does the same thing. Not saying he doesn't have good information too. But the bottom line is, how are you supposed to know which is which? Well, I, in fact, actually do know which is which when I pay attention, which isn't often because it just wears me out. And actually with some back in videos, I'm transferring them into, it, it doesn't take long, into PDF so I can read them because I'm going to be saying some more about things like this. Not referencing him, but just, you know, because what he's saying is like, especially about BP, it's like, sure, buddy. And the thing is, you can kind of find a clinician, never mind the crazy studies. You can kind of find something if you go through enough books, as I'm sure he has, right? Without a doubt, he's a very, very smart person. He's just a malignant narcissist psychopath lacking the balance of emotion and a whole lot of the other side of the view because he's looking at things to aggrandize himself. And like only he could have said borderlines are failed narcissists, right? Like seriously, no, they're not. And, and there is one person's theory out there. I don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole, but yeah, Kernberg talks about borderline personality organization. Alexander Lowen kind of ranks BPD higher than NPD. So there's that out there, but it's not really, I mean, I want, I want to talk more about narcissistic personality and things to do with BPD and the narcissism within BPD because there's that too before you even get to the next level or if they have traits of NPD. And then I really need to look to, I, I know whose work to look to because there was actually a psychiatrist pioneering a lot of work out there, lovely textbooks, a lot of writing, a lot of work left behind. And he was a narcissist himself, and he pioneers a lot of understanding about narcissistic personality or pathological narcissism 
that does to a degree run through all cluster B, but not the same in each presentation at all. Like maybe Kernberg sometimes makes it seem like. But the bottom line is, so I'm talking about Kahoot, who basically has a much more measured and somewhat humanistic approach to, I would say, the lower levels of narcissistic personality disorder. So five traits, six traits versus, you know, all the traits or malignant narcissist and beyond. So anyway, yeah, um, it's from everything that I've read, everything that I've learned. It's, it's because I don't get my information from the internet, right? Like, you know, people, I, I just have to laugh. You know, yeah, people can learn things. But when a YouTuber says, blah, 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 blah whatever, about, you know, something, um, I Googled it. Or you know they just Googled it because that's not the sum total of research, right? And so when I'm going to talk about these borderline narcissist dynamics more, I know exactly which books I'm going back to. And I know exactly what I want to say. Well, I need to think about it a bit. But I know exactly what I want to quote and from whom. And guess what? In all the clinical books I've ever read in my life, I don't see Bakhtin anywhere. So that just gives it just tells me straight up, like whatever dude's about, whatever dude's doing. I'm not saying he's always wrong, but on BPD is kind of a nightmare. Trying to fuse everything about borderlines as if they're narcissists or perfect fit for narcissists or fantasies. They have the same fantasies as the narcissist, which I thought back in his video on the shared fantasy of what the, what the narcissist, because he obviously knows what he's talking about, about his own experience, what the narcissist does with the partner to bring him into the shared fantasy, which, that was fascinating. But when he starts talking about BPD, I'm like, oh, please, head, stop hitting ceiling. So, yeah, we'll talk about that much more. But, I, I mean, if there's anything I know that's a little bit in between that I might have, like, figured out or can say in a certain way, that comes from all the things I've learned from many other pioneering clinicians. So, yeah, I didn't pioneer any method. Uh, although I might have a little bit of something that I do do in a couple of ways. That, that maybe I should try to write about it because maybe it is, but it's still an offshoot of other people's work, like most things are these days, right? So like when Pete Walker wrote his book on CPTSD, that was him elaborating on the work of Judith Herman, right? It was a very common thing in psych psychology, et cetera. So, but yeah, well, uh, just a second, I should uh, make sure I take a picture of your comments. I don't forget that I need to do that. Um, whoops. Okay, so, um, yes, definitely. Thank you for mentioning that. And, yes, you see, I'm, I'm really a humble person because I'm not going to take what you said, your compliment. No, I'm going to tell you the truth, which is, no, I didn't pioneer any of it. Working off of it, though, informed by it. Um, Dahmer was supposedly, yes, and, and I don't know, but we know that that was real. That's been established. And a lot of that took place in Canada because that's what the U.S. does. They they bring their dirty stuff up here. I don't know if it works anymore today. But back in the day when nobody would have thought that could have ever happen, it wasn't initiating in Canada, but they do a lot of their worst up here because nobody's looking. Um, dissociative identity disorder, um, that's controlled by a handler who triggers them. Um, <clears throat> that's a lot of what they were doing. They were doing other things as well. And by the way, well, you, you sound like you know a lot about it, but if anybody's more interested in knowing more about that, which I'm just not choosing to use the words here, um, go to True Stream Media, one of my favorite channels, and uh, they're great researchers. And they did a documentary, mind-blowing, three hours plus, called Mind or Minds of Men. And in there, they feature Dr. Peter Bragan, one of my very few heroes who's a psychiatrist who has been always debunking his profession and about the meds, et cetera, and all the way back to psychosurgery because he is over 80 years old now. It, God, keep him going strong because he's really written an incredible book about the Panduli thing in case you're interested in finding out some absolute truth there because Dr. Peter Bragan is trustworthy, man. So Trusty Media has Minds of Men documentary featuring often throughout that documentary on the subject you mentioned here, um, Hey Arnold, 
uh, featuring Dr. Peter Bregan. And so that that's that's a must see if people haven't seen that and they're interested in that. And um, but I don't know if that's true of Dahmer. Don't know if that was going on. But let me clear one thing up about Jeffrey Dahmer. He was not somebody with borderline personality disorder. He was a psychopath. And Dr. Fox has a video on that recently. And then there was another case I was following, a more recent case. I think I'm going to email Dr. Fox. <laughs> I want Dr. Fox to talk about it because I could do it, but I like it when it comes from Dr. Fox for some reason. I don't know why, because then I can quote him. Uh, it just has to do with the Parkland school, you know, horrific animal who got diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder correctly because he was diagnosed with conduct disorder at such a flipping young age. Um, and these psychopaths are born that way, by the way. The other thing is um, he was also diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. I'm like, this forensic psychologist, psy sorry, was a forensic psychiatrist, is out of his flipping mind. So if anybody else beats me to it, but I'm, I, I've been meaning to email Dr. Fox because he probably didn't watch that trial or whatever. I don't want to ask him. I, well, I'm going to try to email. Maybe other people will too. But I'm going to send him a clip so he doesn't have to waste his time. And then I'm going to say, could you please do a video on this? Because I know he will see it like I do. That guy has nothing to do with borderline personality disorder. He's a psychopath. But you see, the APA has this agenda. I don't understand why. But they're trying to put psychopathy and BPD together. It, it makes no sense. And then they're trying to say that ASPD is, no, BPD is a female variant of ASPD. Drives me nuts because you want to know something? There's a whole lot of studies out there for what any of them are worth. But when they look for these, because a lot of them are doing this, doesn't make any sense. They're starting to redefine, maneuver around what is a psychopath. Oh, geez, you know. The work of Dr. James Fallon is, is I think, the seminal work to follow on, on understanding psychopathy. And they're born that his work is incredible and he happens to be a malignant narcissist psychopath too. But hey, they're not all, you know, antisocial and they're not all not doing something effective. Just saying. But so um oh geez, I lost my other train of thought there. Um yeah, so this constant, ridiculous, flawed ideology trying to inculcate people that people with BP have secondary psychopathy, and especially they don't ever mention the men really with BPD, do they? But they say it's the female variant. BP is a female variant of ASPD. Yeah, sure. If it is, I'm a monkey's uncle and I'll eat my hat. Why do I say that? Well, because I've looked at lots of studies and prison studies can be much more um, telling in some ways, although I don't think they prove what they say either wholly because they started off with the flawed ideology that there's secondary psychopathy traits in borderlines. Okay. So let's just, you know, there. But that notwithstanding, there are studies I've read wherein they are looking at prison population only, people with BPD, assessing maybe a lot of things or whatever they're doing, but also included, there was stats on, in this one study, two studies I read, different stats, of course, on um, the, the percentage of secondary psych or psychopathic traits in borderlines in prison, which, by the way, is still an inaccuracy in flawed logic, but... It was 76% male, 29% female. So where in the H-E double hockey sticks did it, because yeah, I'm passionate about this. Where do they get off? I'm not just for women, I'm for women and men equally, but where does that stupid APA and their pseudoscience crap, where do they get off saying, based on a study unreplicated that is nothing but flawed ideology, that BPD is a female variant of ASPD? When, when they're looking for these traits or whatever they're up to, they find it like, what, over 50% more in males. Like, I care about that. Stop playing games with us. It doesn't help anybody. Anyways, that's a lot on that. So, But Dahmer definitely wasn't a borderline any more than the Parkland, you know what. I just don't want to use certain words in this algorithm. Uh, Jocelyn's mom. Thank you, AJ. The conversation has been so interesting and informative. I'll be back again. Well, that'd be great. Nice to see you. This is really kind of when I'm in my element. This is what I was really designed to do. And would have loved to have brought more of that to you know where, but like wasn't doable. Just wasn't doable.
But really nice to see you again. It would be nice to see you in the future. And take care. And you're welcome. Um, Dexterity, no, let's name them. Um, sorry, but I, I'm not sure what that's in reference right, to right now. Um, and Justin's mom, next I'm going to watch your Borderline Abuse Cycle live stream. Oh, cool. I Well, I hope that it's helpful. That was the last one I did, I think. It's probably been almost two months, I think, or longer. I'm not sure. Um, oh, say that. Oh, name that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you know what? I hardly ever get a live stream that gets to be monetized. So am I trying to have one now? Yes, I am. Right? But I don't very often. So maybe you could cut me a little slack on that because I really don't very often. I just assume that it's going to be impossible. And once in a while, you know, hey, I'm working hard here. So once it, it, once in a while, I just try to see if I can do that. Um, so, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I do apologize because it is a little bit lousy when that happens. And I don't do it very often. And I don't know if I've done it successfully here anyway. So, um, well, that's interesting. Why am I seeing something in one place and not the other? Okay, I don't know. But anyway. So, yeah, people really need to keep remembering, and it's really hard when you're the ex of someone with BPD or there's been a breakup, but those breakups often don't take the first time around, and people have to be really careful, um, yeah, to get into a healing recovery journey and wherever you are. As I've been saying lately, like, just for, you know, if I resonate with people for my part in what I do, um, I have clients that come to me any stage of any of this, like you might still be married to the person with BPD. You might, um, you know, you, you might be wanting them back. You might've recycled eight times. You might still be in a really sort of, you don't know what you want kind of place. So I just want people to know you don't have to be in a no contact place or have everything solved before reaching out to start really working on things because it can really help people to process and to make um, choices for themselves that feel impossible when the relationship is broken up, even after considerable amounts of time often. Um, no more wolf. Hey there. Uh, yeah, I'm doing well. I hope you're doing well too. I hope I read that right. So small here. So anyway, with that, I think probably, oh my, over four hours. Yes. I meant to do two hours today. Anyway, um, it's always great when there's a lot of participation, questions, things to talk about. And as you know, I have an associative mind, or if you don't know, I have an associative mind. So when I'm talking about one thing, I can easily end up talking about something else. It's related, but it might go a little bit far afield from the subject. And I know when I do live streams here, that it doesn't really matter, sometimes it does more than others, what I entitle them because we may go all over the place anyways. So I was hoping to say a little bit more about borderlines not being capable of relationships, healthy relationships, but I have said a lot on that and I will say more on that. And I'm just trying to drive home the point for those who are still in the place, the really painful place of really expecting, hoping for, the false hope for the change, for the try again, for the get back to where it was, or in other relationship types, you know, wanting that parent still to change, needing that parent to change. Because I have more clients that have been with cluster Bs recently that are working on that, um, or the last few years, working in those healing recovery journeys that, you know, then, then we have to directly do a multiple, you know, kind of like process. And one is, healing and recovery from the BPD or NPDX and then in the inner child work and everything, but healing from a cluster B parent in a lot of people's cases, but not everybody's. So I just really want to once again, drive home that no matter what you're feeling and after breakups, breakups aren't always, you know, breakups are supposed to be black and white, which is the irony of it all. Because in relationships, people with BPD are black and white, the dichotomous thinking. Some people with codependency can be a little bit more dichotomous thinkers than they think they are, but perhaps not in their business life. But, you know, emotionally speaking, think, trying to apply logic to things that you can't make sense out of. 
And so with all that, and, and we're trying to, you know, help people with BPD to find the paradox, find the middle, find the gray. Well, actually, these relationship breakups would be, well, they're supposed, let me just say this. Breakups are actually black and white things, basically. By the time, like if two healthier people are breaking up, they're incompatible or whatever, they'll sit down, they'll discuss it. They might, somebody might be angry, but then they'll discuss it. And, you know, because both parties are capable of that, but people with BPD aren't. And so, and they don't know what's going on half the time for them or why this happened or why that happened. And they're never going to take responsibility for it. So the bottom line is that so many things that happen when, when a person with BPD, if they go through, discard you, they come back, whatever. It's like, where is that black and white? Hey, it's a breakup. This isn't good for me. And then there are people who have to struggle to leave the people with BPD still. And that used to be the way it was years ago, pri primarily. So things are morphing and changing. So anyway, watch out for those red flags. And even when you're in a lot of pain, as I've been saying lately, it's really important to heed that and to look at the fact that it ain't working. And if there's been one breakup, two breakups, eight breakups, 15 breakups, and when I do that, I'm not being sarcastic. People recycle a lot of times sometimes. It's never, it's just going to be diminishing returns, more pain, diminishing returns. And these red flags need to be stop signs. And of course, people can't always identify that earlier than they do get around to identifying that. And hey, Arnold, you said if a person with BPD gets misdiagnosed with NPD or bipolar, can they still heal <clears throat> at the same rate if they were properly as if they were properly diagnosed? Um, and do misdiagnoses happen often? Um, I would think that misdiagnoses are probably they happen more than we like to think they do. They happen probably more than anybody would want them to. But I don't know how to quantify often. But yeah, just generally speaking, it's probably true. But I, I don't know for sure, you know. But I've had a lot of client. Yeah, well, even the client work I've done for years. Um, I would say, yeah, it's probably very common, unfortunately. And so if a person gets, no, if somebody gets misdiagnosed with NPD or BPD, I mean, bipolar. If they got diagnosed with NPD by mistake, I don't know. They might still benefit from some therapy. The only thing is a lot of places that treat BPD wouldn't take them. So that would matter. Um, and if they get diagnosed with bipolar by mistake, no, they're really, they're not, they're not going to find much success in therapy until that gets redressed. Or somebody that they're working with uh, says, wait a minute you know, something here that doesn't make sense or doesn't fit together. Um, so it, it would impede um, their healing process. And because if not accurately diagnosed then or accurately assessed by somebody treating somebody, then how are they going to know the lay of the land of what that treatment should be? And bipolar basically being so different. I mean, I know there's overlapping similarities and things, but the causation and the reality of those BPD and bipolar being so different um, with bipolar, the meds are super important with BPD. The meds are useless. Okay. So there's a really big difference there. So if somebody's got bipolar, they get diagnosed with BPD. They're going to go through hell because they're really going through something that's happening literally in their brain and it's not about reacting to emotions only. And, and so that's, you know, they wouldn't get anywhere. And uh, somebody who actually has BPD and is trying to get bipolar treatment, no. So, yeah, it does matter. Accuracy does matter. And yet more and more, I know when I work with people, I'm, I'm not so concerned about labels depending on where people are at and what, what part of their journey they're in, you know, so it depends and, or whether labels are discussed or not. If I have any confusion, I definitely will you know try to clarify, but generally speaking, after almost 33 years of doing this with clients, I can kind of discern, Oh, this looks like that. And this looks like that. And then if it really is that it, it like take, for example, a client that might come to me that might be codependent for sure have a BPDX, but uh, maybe they do have something going on in the NPD realm. 
Now that's not that's not the case very often. It's not the majority of people by any means. And just because your borderline calls you a narcissist, it's it's generally speaking, like 98% of the time, something you don't even need to pay attention to. Um, so yeah, accuracy matters. And um, sorry, I've just got strange eyes now and I can't read your name and it's it's the small print. Oh wait, over here. Uh, oh, Gabrielle, sorry. Um, survived the ca 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 catastrophic, ca cata oh boy. Um, catastrophic, that's what I'm trying to say. Destruction of a 23 year marriage to a BPD. She is textbook and hurting the kids. How can I get her to recognize her disorder and get help? Wow, I'm so sorry to hear what you've been through, what you're dealing with now. Um, the catastrophic destruction over 23, 23 years of marriage um, and, and her being so textbook, which means, and it sounds like she's just at the very end of the most severe that she could be. Um, I'm sorry she's hurting your kids for sure. Um, they might need therapy. Hopefully they, you know, don't have anything in cluster B. I would say that, uh, I, d I don't think there's any way that you could probably get her to recognize her disorder and get help at this point. I mean, because, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you've likely tried before. Um, and she sounds like she's really at the end of like the most severe. It's been going on for 23 years. She's textbook. I think that what you need to do, I, I hope your children aren't too young. What you need to do there is do the best you can for your kids and whatever's happening. Um, you said you survived it. So I don't know if you're still in it or out of it. Um, but the marriage that is, but really, you know, essentially if you've never tried before, uh, the best thing you, I, I mean, the best thing to say to these people isn't, I think you have BPD or I think you have this. It's more like, you know, I don't know, take an example. This happened and this affected, you know, one of your children this way. And, you know, but, but they probably won't be able to hear it. So I don't mean to sound so fatalistic about it, but I would say that, um, yeah. Okay. Just a second. I'll, I'll get to your other comments in, in just a second. Um, Harold, out of the cluster B disorders, people with BPD recover the fastest and are most likely to get help question. Um, well, it's not fast. So there's really no fastest there. Um, I've worked with some people with covert more, it's not a diagnosis, right? But the, co the fragile vulnerable narcissist, I've helped people like that recover. And sometimes that can go a bit better than people in BPD with BPD in recovery it depends on awareness, et cetera, and willingness to open. Um, but generally speaking, BPD is much more treatable, um, but it's not necessarily, it, it's not, I can't really say the fastest just simply because it takes eight to 16 years. And for a lot of people, that's going to be the 12, the 13, the 14, the 15 years. So um, they, there's the most treatment available for BPD. And like I said, I don't think DBT is a recovery modality. I think it's an excellent treatment. I think people that go through that with BPD, then they need to go on to a psychodynamic modality to go down to the bottom of it all, so to speak, when they have better coping skills. So um, BPD is more treatable, but it isn't any kind of fast recovery. And yeah, some people with, you know, fragile covert narcissism, if they seek help, they really can be helped. And some of them can be the person with BPD to recovery. So, but anyway, just would that it was faster in general for anybody with BPD or NP that would seek treatment. Um, your children are 23, 21, 19, 13, oh, and six. And you said, um, <coughs> pardon me, that you're separated and content. Well, you know, at this point, I would ask you, since it's probably really futile for you to try to think that she's going to recognize this now, um, after all these years, 
I think really I would I would think it's up to you whether you want to try or not, but I don't I think it would be futile. The other thing is really just keep being there for your kids, especially your six year old. And hopefully the older ones are coming along okay. Or if 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 you see any concerns there, you know, get them into a like the 13 year old or the six year old into a child uh, psychologist and have them evaluated and get early intervention if need be. And hopefully the other three are doing fairly well. But if they're having any issues, then, you know, try to help them as much as you can. Maybe if they, uh, hopefully they don't need therapy, but maybe they do have some issues um, because their mother sounds like way at the end of the spectrum of BPD at at the very least. And so I, I would say to you, you know, put your energy and efforts into you're separated and you're content and taking care of yourself and and all your resources beyond because you have to take care of you first so you can be there for your kids then you know put all your energy towards your kids and if they're doing well great and if they need a little help along the way just nurture them be with them help them as much as you can and i would say it's probably way too late for her but if you want to try it, just know it probably will be futile. But it's up to you. But it might take away from some of your contentment. Um, hey there, Steve. Um, good. Retirement doesn't exist. I hope you continue to spread your gift. Well, thank you for that. It's very humbling. I appreciate the kind words. And, yeah, I'm definitely not going to turn 65 next Saturday and go, that's it. I'm done. Because, no, it's it's way – it's it's like – when you love what you do and you're passionate about it, it's, 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 yeah, sometimes it really is work. Okay. But it's not like a grinding kind of work very often if you get my drift. So yeah. And I think like, I definitely, you know, as long as I'm doing well and whatnot, I'll just, yeah, keep doing what I do. And the cool thing is I don't have to climb mountains or scale up buildings to do what I do. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, with that, I should probably run now. And um, please feel free if you feel like I spoke to something in this live stream, but not enough, or you'd like to see another video on it, or I mean, I'll be probably on camera someday again, but you'd like to hear, you know, like audio, video, whatever, pocket, whatever comes your way, you'd like more information or content on something, please feel free to leave comments under the live stream here. Um, and uh, I definitely try to get to things that people ask me to do more on. So, and, and it just depends where I am at my thought process and what I'm doing in general across all of the different areas where I'm giving content now too. So, uh, yeah, thank you for everybody who, who was here listening and are participating, coming and going, etc. Uh, yeah, I, I maybe need to look at doing a live stream maybe like at least twice a month. Cause I don't think I would go back to weekly. I just not, not enough time. But uh, I definitely enjoy it. And um, it, if it's helpful to people, it's it's really nice to interact with people as opposed to just doing the audio, video, podcast, whatever it is, or video and putting it up. And yeah. So anyway, and I was going to say there's been more engagement. Like there's always been engagement across a lot of videos on this channel. But there's more engagement, more subscribers coming. So, hey, don't be afraid to leave comments. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't. And engage the channel, you know, and 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 more and more because I think I used to answer too many people's questions or try or whatever. I'm letting you know I don't have enough time, and the channel is growing a little bit. It's it's still not the hugest channel in the world, right? But it's great the size it is. And my point is, so there are many more threads of people supporting each other, dialoguing with each other. So please get involved in that if you feel so inclined. And you know, maybe I'm not as re- replying as often as I might have in the past. But I do take a lot of those comments people share or questions people have, <clears throat> and I will make um, videos, audio videos, or podcasts uh, based on that. So, um, you said, I'd love to hear you elaborate one day on exactly how the codependent may not know themselves after a BPD breakup one day, please. Well, that's interesting because, you know, yeah, I'm going to take a picture of that. And I can definitely speak more about that. And, you know, here's the thing I'm realizing. So I'm learning something right now. Um, I have spoken on a lot of aspects of these things, but they're all within videos that have titles otherwise, right? 
So I think what I've learned from this live stream is I need to do a video on the borderline lack of self, loss of self. Okay. Specifically with that title so people can find it. It'll probably be a podcast because I'm finding podcasting is helpful. And I put it up here. Hopefully you don't mind listening because, I mean, after all, you know, I ain't getting more gorgeous. I'm getting older, whatever. And and so, like, whether I'm on camera or not, I hope most people don't care. Because the bottom line is, yeah, so when you said elaborate one day on exactly how the codependent may not know themselves after BPD breakup. Well, I can, I can definitely look at doing that. And I will, I'll just try to come up with like a list of ways, right? Like maybe five top ways or something in a video. But I want you to know that in a lot of videos where I've talked a lot about codependency in relation to whatever I'm talking about, about BPD, that I probably have talked about that before. But to say that is to say, maybe look at a few videos where uh, you know, the title indicates I'm talking a lot more about codependency you might get some of that there. But yes, I will try to elaborate in a specific content piece, shall I say, because I don't know if it'll be a podcast or a, because, you know, when I do like, like this right now, you know, um, it's just easier for me to not be on camera. I just have like a sore neck, a bad neck. I got dealing with training a rotty puppies killing my neck every day. It's kind of the only reason I'm not on camera. It's not a big deal. But the bottom line is, uh, yeah, hopefully, I think I'm going to be podcasting a lot more because I will do some videos and video here. And just in summary, I will say, but when I do an audio video, like what essentially this is an audio video because it's, it's a live stream and audio, right? With I'm not in video. Uh, then I think to myself, if I'm doing an audio video, I may as well just make it a podcast and put it in the podcast. And then, so I would encourage people if you want, you know, all of the content that I'm going to be putting out or, or depending on titles, etc. that you also subscribe to my podcast, surviving BPD relationship breakup, which is in the description box where the, where podcasts are featured, you know, uh, like on the channel. And then I have a new one coming. Um, I've done the first episode, like I said earlier, it will be up soon. It's called cluster B relationship recovery. And yes, it's going to be different. I mean, anything I say over there about BPD, I'm not going to dwell on BPD much over there, or focus on it because I do so much here. But Cluster B Relationship Recovery is going to give me, the, I think, a better avenue and vehicle now since this channel is mostly about BPD and codependency and has been. I'm going to do on that podcast um, a lot more about sadistic personality, histrionic personality, narcissistic personality disorder, uh, and the dark triad. So, and then there's going to be different aspects of information I want to present that I don't think would fit with this channel either, like maybe five tips to increasing your emotional intelligence or, you know, like various content within. And so that's cluster B relationship recovery. Um, you won't be able to find that just yet, but when I put the first episode up, I also have a podcast I'm going to put more effort into codependency inside out and the surviving BPD relationship breakup. There's a couple others that are planned that I'm toying with that I don't know. So you can find those just by looking up any any of the words I said, put my name behind it, Google it, and it'll come up. So my podcasting platform is Spreaker, and my podcasts go all over the freaking place. So, and, and I do put some up to the channel, but I don't always put every single one up to the channel. So just so people know, and that's about it. For that, that's a little bit of housekeeping stuff, maybe. I don't know. Do we housekeep on YouTube channels? I have no idea. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all your kind words. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for the interaction. Um, I learn things too. You're, you're, you know, the help of what what can I focus on more? Videos I've talked about so many things in, but not with that title and exclusively. Thank you for all that feedback, is very helpful. So everybody take care. And if you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe to the channel. It's still a growing channel and it's got more interaction happening. And that's positive for anybody out there that wants to get support from someone else that might comment to your comment or ask a question that might get my attention and I might not answer all of them. But hey, maybe I'll be doing a video or a podcast on it soon. So anyway, with, uh, <clears throat> with that and my mini marathon here, my throat needs to rest. And I just want to say one last thing in closing. And, and I'm risking noise, but you know, I gave each of my dogs a bone before I started this, that we went out, etc. Because, um, 
my Roddy puppy and good boy Toby, and if you make noise now, it's fine, um, is seven months old now and finally seems to be letting me live stream, and he can be in the same room without barking his head off. So we're making progress. I'm excited about that because I don't want people to have to listen to his barking throughout things. So it was so bad up until recently, and then I'm going to get out of here, so bad up until recently that every time I would hit a record button, whether I was doing some screen, because I got to do some more shorts and that kind of stuff, they say. I was doing something on my phone, and like as soon as I just touched the record button, he used to bark his head off. He's getting much better. Good boy, Toby. You did a really good job today. So, yes, kudos to Toby. Thank you all for being here. I am out now. So I would just say peace out, take care, hope to see you again, and yeah, any suggestions, feel free to leave them in comments under the video that is most relevant. Take care.